Ronnie Kosher live stream. Hey folks, it's Matt from Front Akash Productions, and today we are talking with Nathaniel Freeman, an amazing actor, writer, and director that I'm sure you've seen in some very well-known films. And if you haven't yet, ta-da, Space Command. <laughs> yes, Space Go watch Command. it. Oh. <laughs> and that's, of course, how we met. We met... Uh, at the red carpet event for Space Command. And I don't know if you remember, but we actually met at the bottom of the escalator where I was sitting there, sitting on the floor, on the concrete floor, changing yes. out of my Birkenstocks and putting in these, these multicolored shoes. And wow. then you said, oh, nice shoes, dude. And I was like, thanks. <laughs> and neither of us yeah. know that we actually were going to the exact same thing. So That's then we, we saw each yeah. other up there. <laughs> I was like, I remember, I looked down, I remember the shoes. I was like, yeah, the guy with the cool shoes. Wow, yeah. that was amazing. I thought I was running late, so I was like, uh, otherwise I would have stopped and actually got, where'd you get those shoes? But, you know, try to be yeah. prompt. So got to like, be up there. Okay. Got to get up there and on the red carpet and start taking pictures with all the all your friends. Yeah. Wow. Lots, lots of photos. Wow. Yeah, it's fun, that, though, seeing Seeing the cast again, uh, many of the people uh, that were there that night I hadn't seen since, well, in, well, in, in real life or IRL uh, in the last uh, five or six years. A few. Wow. Yeah. Yep. So it was sort of like a reunion of sorts and uh, very, very uh, well received. I was all warm and fuzzy all evening long. I know. I get that. That I constantly get that vibe from everybody involved with Space Command. It's just like a big, happy family. Yeah, so. yeah, which is, which is, uh, I mean, I, I guess when you're shooting film and television, oftentimes we're working under long hours for many days in a row for many weeks or sometimes months at a time. So you tend to adopt that sort of family like personality. But then as soon as it's over, you know, you're off to the next project and you've all disbanded and you're fragmented and you keep in touch through the internet. But right. with Space Command, we, we've kept in touch uh through emails text messaging social media so we know yeah. what's going on in each other's lives and so when we came back together it was like there was no love uh the love wasn't was still there oh so that's right back, yeah so we're like instant family you know even though it's been years it's like hey come here and hugs and hugs and kisses and and nobody got COVID. well one yeah. person had COVID. <laughs> yeah but yeah yeah the 99 of 99.9 of us were good so. Yeah. Yeah, that was uh, – so what would you attribute to that to? Is that just all coming from Mark and Elaine, or how is it that there's such a good vibe? It starts at the top. With me, I think it starts at the top. Uh, a lot of times when you're working with directors that uh, are, are actor-friendly, um, they know what it's like not only to be on that side of the camera looking at the scenes they want to frame up, but they also know what it's like to be on the other side right. wanting to – portray our characters in the best way possible. And so act directors that are that way, like Mark, Mark um, tend to create this atmosphere of creativity where you're free to speak up and say, hey, you know what? I, I'm glad we cut here because I'm not, can I talk about my character or this line in particular? He's open to that. Whereas a but, lot of others. And that's the advantage because, up. yeah, because yeah. he's not only is he the director, he's also the writer, right? He wrote the script, yeah. didn't he? He and Elaine? Yeah. Yes. So you yes, guys can did. potentially, if some line isn't working, you could edit it on the spot. Mm -hmm. Did he let you do that? Uh, I think there were a few things that happened because, you know, we're all spontaneous, creative people. If we do it and it's not scripted, but it works, yeah, why not? Leave it in there. Because the, 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 bottom, the bottom line is you want uh, the finished product to be something that, the people will enjoy, you know, and if you, you sp spontaneously say or do something that creates a moment where people are on the edge of their seats, whether it's laughter or anger or surprise, and you take that moment out, you rob people of that, that emotion, that connection that they feel to what they're looking at. So right. I say if it works, leave it in there. Yeah. 
Plus, it seems like sometimes the best stuff is what's improvised in the spot because it's so spontaneous that it comes. It's really authentic, right? It's, it's uh, got so much behind it. Yeah, for me, acting is, is it's it's not just saying the words that are written, but it's reacting. So, so the person I'm in a scene with. Mm -hmm. If his energy or her energy is low or if they're not in the scene, I have nothing to play off of. And so it, it, I match that and we're both uh, just saying our lines. But yeah. if there's enthusiasm and, and, and excitement to what they're saying, it's, it's reciprocated. And boom, we have this swirling mass of atoms and just words and emotions. And then that's when the magic happens. Right. Speaking of swirling masses of atoms... Your, your Zoom is doing this really freaky thing, trying to blur out the background. Oh, yeah, so like I think. The, uh, and it's wild because it, the background keeps coming in and out. Well, I can see if you want to cut for a second, I can see if I can take it off in settings. Because uh, yeah. I think it's a natural choice. If it's too distracting, give me a second. Anyway, what were we talking about? <laughs> uh, oh, Space Command. The energy. Oh, and, the energy, and, uh, yeah. Okay. And creativity and the keeping things in that are spontaneous on the set and how we're still a family after seven years apart. Right. Wow, yeah. Pretty and there's good. a lot I happening. I know, I know Marx wants to film the entire first season now. That's his goal. Yes. And he's been, yes. he told me that you guys are all the way up to uh, episode six now? I believe so. Five or six? So. Yes, yes. I think it's number six. I should know uh, this. In fact, uh, we started and we took a break because we have to shoot some more scenes. We're waiting for another actor who's currently on Broadway. So uh -huh. when he's done in a few more weeks and is able to fly out here, uh, we can pick up where we left off. Who might yes. that be? I, or is it a secret? I, no, I don't think it's a secret. Faran, Faran to here. Let me see oh. if I got him in my movie poster. He would be, uh, am I pointing in the right way? That's always hard. Yeah, I think maybe. I, um, is he the one who played in the J.J. Oh, oh, Abrams Star Trek? Okay, hold on. It's really hard to see. Yeah. Yes. He was in the open. He was in the opening scene of Star Trek 2009 with Chris Pine and everybody. Uh, that's right. right. I remember him from uh, Iron Man. That's what I saw the very first Iron Man. Okay, unless yes. I'm got kind him of confused with someone else, but I think that's true. I can. Yeah. But, but yeah, he's. Uh, that's neat. He's a good guy. Yeah. So when he's 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 done. He comes back out here, and then uh, we start shooting again. Cool. Yeah, yeah. you know, um, I just interviewed uh, Sarah Marfino. Did you get to yes. know her at all? She's so cool. Uh, yes, yes. In fact, she was not at the. Uh, I, don't, I didn't see. She wasn't the at the red carpet. Uh. -uh. <laughs> yeah. I forgot to uh, ask her about that because she lives in L.A. I wonder why she didn't go. Anyway, huh. she's such a, you know, it's so funny because in Space Command, she plays a really hardcore warrior <laughs> captain, yes. you know, with the short hair yeah. and the bleach and bleach blonde hair. And she's just like, uh, you know, really tough. So I thought she was going to be like that in real life, but she's not. She's actually a really sweet, a real sweetheart. Yes. She was so nice. She knows, obviously, I think what we, what we got to was that, in her earlier days, she pretty much was that. But then as she's um, matured a bit and had her 40th birthday, she's, she's mellowed out quite a bit and, and has sort of had to kind of drop that when needed and just kind of show her vulnerable side. And so she's That's just, nice. yeah, she's a real, she's a really talented actor too. We went through her reels and stuff and she has a wide range. So I, and we, we have a scheme. I'm sure you don't know, but, and I've already been putting the bug in Mark's ear. We have this scheme to bring Sarah back, except playing a completely different character. Why not? Yeah. She's got chops. She could totally We've do it. She's got a great makeup, makeup department. Yeah. And hair and makeup are flawless. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, well, now her hair is, not? it's not platinum blonde anymore. Her hair is now a kind of a chestnut color, but it's still oh. pretty short. 
but they could she could always put on a wig or something like that. But yeah, it'd be fun. So have you ever done any acting, Matt? I have actually, and in fact, I'm even taking acting classes and um, acting or uh, accents. I have an accent Ooh. coach that I work with quite a bit, and um, but I'm awfully late to the game. So I mean, like I'm in my fifties, and it's only been a couple years that I've considered myself to be an actor, basically because of my YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. And then I've got like Star Trek. I have a Star Trek fan series that I do where I'm the captain, of course. Well, well, yeah. well. I'm going to have to check that out. Yeah. I grew Plus, up on Star Trek. The well, original. There you go. Yeah. So did Mark. It, Mark. That's Twilight Zone and Star Trek are the two things that really set Mark mm. on his life journey. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, Mark Zickery, by the way, we're talking about Mark. Who's this Mark dude? Mark Zickery, who's the producer of of space command and also um he's written uh quite a famous or quite a well-known book called the twilight zone companion zone companion yes yeah. yes yeah so yeah anyhow it's like and um also i'm a space command investor so whenever mark needs to get to raise money he's I, i'm on his call list <laughs> so nice. he actually called me this week yeah. And so, um, and he said he's going to call me next week too. Like, I shouldn't say this, but of course, when he's out raising funds, I, I told Mark, I said, you know, I mean, I could just put down a chunk, a big chunk of money, you know, for Space Command. But then if I did that, you'd never call me again. <laughs> so I, it's better for me just to give you a little bit and then I know you're going to call me again and then I get to know you better. <laughs> So you know what he said? No, no, Mark said, he goes, well, what I could do, we can make a deal. Like, uh, if you put down, like, this much, I promise to call you once a week for the next year. And I'm like, well, no, I like this other way better. <laughs> so, You're only the third investor that I've met. I have met many of them. Uh, but uh, I, I, it's, it's good to know that people believe in us and, and what we're doing. And uh, yeah, and our support, you know, not just with you know words, but with 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 their wallets as well. So thank you. Yeah, well, yeah. Mark's a good salesman. I mean, he really knows how to um to pitch the mission of the show, mm -hmm. you know, and all the positive things that it brings. And um, he has a lot of connections, man. I mean, <laughs> I also I interviewed him on this channel a while ago, and. I, I talked about all the talents he had, and then I said that he's the world champion name dropper. Because <laughs> he well, seems to yeah, know everyone yeah. in the in the business, and and he can just rattle off their name right like then and say, "Well, I worked with so and so, you know." And I remember when I worked with so and so at this and that and whatever. And, yeah, you know. <laughs> he's so. he, he's been. I, I got here uh, from New York, where I'm from, in 2004. Oh, okay. And my then manager, uh, who's also from New York, okay. she was a member of, of uh, the group called The Table that Mark and Elaine started. Oh, so right, many yeah. Years ago. And it's still going on. And in, I was introduced to Mark and Elaine at that very first meeting. And uh, I've been going ever since. But he was name dropping then, and that was 18 years ago. So, yeah, he knows everybody. Yeah, you know, and uh, and and Elaine, and and it's it's good though because in a town like this, you want to be plugged in. Yeah, it helps. Yeah, yeah. you can it's be talented, like... but they're not. Yeah, so yeah, that's the name of the game. A... Yeah, wow. Well, he's he actually gave me. Well, I went down again after the um, after the red carpet event. I recently went down. They had a little um, thing at right outside the Warner Brothers lot. They had like a sort of, um, what would you call it? A luncheon at the smokehouse. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've ever eaten there. It's this restaurant right across the street from Warner Brothers. And, um, no, doesn't sound familiar. well, it's got good food. And, and anyhow, they did a thing where Mark, um, had people come and there was maybe like 20 people there in, in sort of a semi private room and we all had lunch. And then Mark um, did a spiel and talked about Twilight Zone and, um, you know, and then signed autographs and too. And um, 
there was another guy there, the guy who does um, Coast to Coast Radio. Oh, man, I can't believe I forgot his name. This always happens. He's also on the History Channel, like on Ancient Aliens now. Oh. Yeah, because he's really into UFOs, and he's a buddy of Mark. And anyways, they both came and did a sort of a live chat, and we were like the live audience and and had our had our lunch and stuff. And then afterwards, they did selfies and um, yada, yada. And... I mean, it was it was kind of a VIP event because it was like a hundred dollars a plate, uh-huh. and um, but I mean that's not super extravagant for a good meal, so you know. Especially so, in LA, you could pay that easily without yeah. drinks. You know, hundred bucks. Yeah, just like that, for two people. Yeah. So, anyways, that's I the love- last time I saw him, and then the very next day, um, I asked him. I said, Mark, um. Since I'm, I'm really mad that I missed the the tour of the set from the red carpet because I had to go to a, a a wedding the next day, so I had to zip out. And like maybe when I'm back in, maybe I can get a tour of the set. You know, if, if there's a way to pull that off. And he's like, Yeah, I think I can do that. So, anyways, I was expecting there to be a bunch of people. You know, <laughs> it was just me, my friend Mark, and um, Angelique. Well, and yes, I was like, well, I wasn't expecting a personal tour from the the creator of the show, <laughs> you know. But so he just showed me around, you know, and uh, you probably know all this, but like, like he's like, well, here's like these really cool chairs that I saw a guy was put out on his sidewalk for free. So I grabbed them because <laughs> they looked <laughs> really modern. And actually, they, I, you could, they're like these white vinyl sort of 50s sci-fi looking chairs, you know? I remember those, yes. I got a <laughs> raft in my back. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I... <laughs> Anyways, he was showing me, and he's like, and I got this from, like he also knows how to go out and, and get props and stuff that are going to work from mm-hmm. like um, fire sales. Like he, he, of course, he's so hooked in. He knows what shows are, 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 are closing up and he knows that all their sets and stuff are now available so he'll go grab them you know so he's got a good eye for that stuff yeah uh, and then he showed me like and he has a really stuff. good he has like an amazing uh props department all the people that are on the other side of the camera are really dedicated professionals i mean just this last time we worked uh with the, the costume person is looking at us and he was like it's missing something. And he says, I think you guys need a holster for your guns. And then he write it by Mark Martin. Wonderful idea. So we're thinking it's going to be something that's going to happen weeks out from now. Right. He made sketches that evening. The next day on the set, we come back and he's got a holster for me and a holster for wow, that was uh, Bradbury. And and I was, yeah. He like on his own time, he went back home and just like whipped this up. And I'm saying that's the kind of dedication that, that uh, Mark and Elaine uh, have with the people that work for them. They, they believe so much that they're willing, you know, put in the extra effort. Uh, same thing with the costume. Same thing with, I, I got a free haircut, you know? And I was like, All right. well, you know, I have a little time. If you want me, I can, I can shape up the back for you. And I was like, uh-huh. yeah, why not? Yeah. You know, I'm going to share. Yeah, you know, it's like, uh, okay. Did they, did they give you that hat so, uh, too? That's a very cool looking hat, I have to say. Oh, um, this I got a little bit a decade ago. Uh, Ooh, is it Heather? With somebody else. No, no, no. Would you believe this is, uh, I'm, I'm very um, green. Everything okay. I try to do, like everything is faux leather, faux this, faux that. This is paper. This is a paper hat. Wow. Yes. That looks yes. great. It's biodegradable. Whenever I retire this, this can just decompose and become someone's uh, rose garden or something. But uh, I just figured it went with the ensemble today. I went to see a film and yeah. I came straight back. I saw, yeah. Did you say Emmett? Uh uh-uh. uh. Oh, I thought you said the name of the film. I was like, how did you know? I went to see Till today, the story of Emmett Till. Oh, cool. Uh, and it was playing at the, uh, at the Grove. So, ran over there and I came back with just enough time to eat, feed the dogs, and then pop a pier. Otherwise, yeah. I'd probably have my Space Command t shirt on to oh. advertise. I just came in the mail, but I do have it here someplace. Oh, you got it. Wow. Okay. Because uh, yeah. I didn't know they were available again. Because supposedly the one I was wearing one at the red carpet, and uh, everyone was like, "Where'd you get that?" And I'm like, "Well, um, Dave gave it to me." Of course, when you say yeah. that, which Dave? There's about five of them. 
<laughs> and that's Space Command. Really, <laughs> yeah, Dave, but I think it was Dave Bartlett. Okay, David Bartlett, yeah. is that right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh-huh. Executive producer. If you want to hang on a second, I can get it for you. It'll take me about, just got to run upstairs. Okay. All okay, right. We'll right take back. a quick station break. Uh, we're going to have a lava lamp moment. So let's all cast our gaze over to this area here and focus upon the amazingly alien looking blob on the lava lamp. It's still sort of warming up, so the the emotion within it is extremely slow. However, what you may want to do as you gaze upon that blob, you might up the up the speed of the frame rate and then you can see it evolve in a little quicker. Oh, oh the, so we're back. Lava, yeah. We were yeah. doing our lava lamp uh, meditation. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> your moment of zen yes yeah this is the church that's it oh oh that's a new one that's new and if i hold this correctly how do i there do i can see it in fact i think that's the same graphic that I, was in the poster that i threw up oh no it's not mine's this mine's redemption but yours is forgiveness mm-hmm. and forgiveness and then- got to show it to my mom. You can see yours truly here. Okay. Holding well, well, well. Okay, move it up a tad. There we go. There go. you are. Oh. Nice. Yeah. So, so that's episode yeah. three or two? Uh, for I forget. Okay. I think it's two. Nice. Yeah. Oh, and this is the actor that I was talking about. Who's coming back? This, right. This is for us. Uh, yeah. Um, so, uh, so, so I think he, I'm pretty. Isn't he? Wasn't he in? Um, oh shoot. Um, what's the show? Come on. What the show? Oh man, people are gonna kill me when I can't pull this one out. Well, it's a famous okay. TV it's like, show. Yeah, it's the or, one Stargate. Uh, wasn't he? Is he the guy that was in Stargate? I'm pulling. I don't think up. he was actually. I'm comp- I'm getting I have lost here. Warehouse 13, Backstrom, American Crime Story. Uh, I don't see the one you were talking about. Okay. Do you see the- Star Trek in there anywhere? Like w- Space Command Satisfaction 2009 would be Star Trek. 2009, I see NCIS Los Angeles. That's the only thing from that year. Okay. Then I got yeah. it mixed up with, then he's just a lookalike. He looks a lot like the person who was in. Um, oh, wait. It says ca- Star Trek. Yeah, it says Star, at least known for Elysium, Star Trek, Iron Man, Escape Plan. So he was a okay, Star Trek. Okay, Star Trek. So I'm pretty sure then we're talking about the guy who was um, the captain uh. of. Um, Captain Kirk's father's ship. Yeah. Okay. We're talking the 2009 oh, Star Trek. Yeah. Oh, I, I, well, I think that's him. Fans I are going to yeah. tear me apart. I'm going to get roasted in the comments this time. Like, don't you know anything, man? I can keep this all straight, anyways. Sorry. Let me yeah. Have another program to subscribe to because Mark has Mr. Sci-Fi. Right. And you have a YouTube channel that is Star Trek. Well it's called Pranakasha Productions, which is what this will be aired on. And oh. I do tons of interviews, but if you dig deep enough in there, you can find my Star Trek fan series, which is called Egotastic Trek. And as luck would have it, I will be filming with J.P. Justin Poole, uh, and I've got a picture of him, the footage, final scenes of episode four will be filmed this Sunday via Zoom, because he lives in Oklahoma, and I live in Seattle, which is how we do the show. It's all green screens, and uh, most of the actors are not local, so we do it all using Zoom, And it's, but you'd be, you would never know it. If you, when you watch the show, you would never know. 
Interesting, because yeah. we did something like that too back during the when COVID was at its was in its infancy, just right. going into teen years. Yeah, we uh, we uh, all got copies of the script emailed to us, and we learned our lines, and we <laughs> the Zoom thing, and we all we had to do was get make sure we were behind the. We didn't have a green screen, a green screen, just as long as we're behind a blank wall. Oh, it was good you enough. Well, wow. and then they mesh it together. But I'd love to see your your finished product. Yeah, well, so, of course, the problem with doing it that way is uh, it goes against exactly what you were talking about at the beginning, and what my acting coach says, and what all actors apparently know is that acting really isn't acting; it's reacting, reacting to what your partner. Well, mm. when we're doing it on a green screen, you don't have a partner. <laughs> You have to imagine your partner. Yeah. So that's, it's a totally different deal. Right. You know, of course, sometimes when I'm wife. directing, I'll feed, sometimes I'll feed him lines and I'll like, if he's talking to Captain Hardinger, I might actually play Captain Hardinger so he can bounce off me, but it's still not the same because I'm not in costume and I'm not right next to him, you know, and it's not like we're really putting ourselves in the roles, you know, well, that makes it hard. It reminds me, of something I would do when I have audition because I haven't had an in-person audition in years now. They've, they've all gone to self-tape. Right. I, uh, since I live alone, uh, if I have to put myself on tape and I'm recording myself in the scene with another person or two, mm -hmm. I use all my Apple products in unison. I have my uh, Bluetooth speaker. Well, actually what I do is I record the other person's lines spoken into my iPhone. Okay. I mouth mine silently while okay. speaking out of the person's in their accent. You know, maybe I'll talk like this, right? You know, say you go over oh. there, you go in the bar and you get those blokes and you bring them out in the street, right? And I go, Did you hear me? You know, I do that. So then it's recorded, right? Then I play it back with the Bluetooth speaker out loud so that it has that and then I say my lines back and forth so there is bad so you react to yourself forth. interesting yes. that's cool well bravo but, on the accents how many accents can you do i didn't really i don't have a, don't know if i have a count but i i can name the few that i do i do a number of uh english accents okay. uh latin accents jamaican uh caribbean uh and then of course regional ones you know talk notes because southern like country um, yeah. You know, shoot dog bars over there, or, or, um, uh, so, or I'm working on Australia and New Zealand. I, I have a few, I have three friends that are uh, Aussies and two Kiwis, <laughs> cool. and uh, um, I'm absorbing when I talk to them. I listen. Pick it up. I, yeah, I'm like a sponge that way. Wow. So, Do you work with a dialect coach at all? Uh, I did. Twice and it lasted all of the day. I did a film, wow. I did a play uh, about seven years ago, seven, eight years ago, uh, where I had to, it was a, a, a farce, a, a, an English farce, and I was, I played a cross dressing guy, an Englishman. Cool. And uh, the entire cast was, was supposed to be British, but we're all American actors. Right. So the director was really concerned mm -hmm. that we, our accents. We're not going to be authentic enough. So she hired a dialect coach to work with all of us. Right. And she set up a, a Zoom meeting. And when she asked me to say my lines, I started talking like this. And she said, I don't really think you need – like, I didn't answer as if I was American. Right? I just started talking like this mm -hmm. right from the very beginning. Right. So she's talking to me. She's listening. And she's going, so um, Mark and um, Debbie says that um, I'm supposed to work with you, but I don't understand why what was, was it necessary. necessary. It's like, I don't I – don't, I reckon I don't know either. Um, do you think she made a mistake? And she said, no, you are Nathaniel. I said, yes. Well, I've, I've, I've got to be honest with you. Um, I don't really talk, like, I, don't, I don't even sound like this enough. Um, in fact, I'm not even from England. In fact, I was born in New York from the Bronx and I talk like this. And I did it yeah. mid-sentence. <laughs> so she kind of jumped back and was like, oh, oh well. Well, I, don't, I can tell them that you don't need the less. And that happened twice, so I guess. When it comes to certain accents, I, I have them down. I'm like That's I said great. earlier, I'm, I'm from New York City, and New I'm York. Trying to oh yeah, what brag, part of New York? Bronx or what? Born in the Bronx, raised in a what was then called Spanish Harlem, which is now, thanks to gentrification, called Upper Yorkville. 
Upper Yorkville, yes. what the hell is that? Yes. <laughs> it's a, it, it makes it more enthusiastic to people that want to invest in the, in the uh, property. Yeah. But, uh, uh, if you, you, that's why they renamed the Hell's Kitchen like Chelsea and Clinton. I don't want to. Where do you live? Hell's Kitchen. Oh my God. <laughs> Who wants to live there at Hell's Kitchen? Of course, it's hey, a famous show live. now. They probably would want to live there now. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. well, you've got Daredevil. Matt, Matt Murdock is protecting the place. So that's <laughs> his, his, his domain. Wow. But well, yeah. that's, that's amazing that you can. Because, like, I have a. Like I said, I got a dialogue coach who I do Zoom calls with like once a week. And mm -hmm. he's got, I mean, he has it all down to a science and like he can do a jillion accents, but he's analyzed it and he's got figured out, you know, exactly how you pronounce certain words, where the, where the sound resonates in your head and it's all mm. figured out. So, which works for me because I'm a musician, so I can like, I can get into that mode. Mm. But, but so, um, and then I try to do, I sort of try to wing it and he'll say, yeah, that's good. Except like you, this, you should really should do that. Not quite like that. And so on. So like right now I'm trying to work on a British <coughs> <Sorry>. accent. <coughs> Excuse me. An RP. Um, yeah. But. I, I, many years ago, I, I met a guy in New York. I think I was working at a restaurant. He was French. And okay. I asked him, I said, um, uh, what's the best way for me to learn French? He said, my friend, the best way for you to learn French is to get yourself a French girlfriend. <laughs> and I, I, when he said that, I realized that it's not so much um, whether it's Berlitz versus uh, Duolingo. It's, it's having somebody around you that can listen with a critical ear and give you the necessary notes you need to get better. On a and besoin d'une amie française, monsieur. Yes. So every time I learned, I learned from somebody. It didn't necessarily have to be a girlfriend, but it was somebody that I was close to. So I could, I could bounce it off of it without having to worry about, do I have enough money for this class, this session, or, you know, mm -hmm. is, it, is it over yet? Or Pas faire mon not très joli, très intelligent. Yes. But uh, I, 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 I love it. <laughs> not bad. Not bad at all. Um, it just it also helps because the more I can do, the more I can do. I, right. I would love to do voiceover work. I did lots of voiceover in New York, not so much out here, hmm. but if I could um, display all the different voices that I could do, put it on a reel and put it in the appropriate hands, I would love hmm. to just do some behind the scenes work. Not to say I don't want to be on camera, but um, I, animation, yeah, uh, audiobooks, all of that. It's just, yeah, it's work that I can do in my pajamas. You know, I yeah, can just get up, well, have my what, tea. What I know a little bit about audiobooks from my teacher, and he says um, the trick to that is you got to be able to just crank those lines out within one take because you got to go through, it, make it through an entire book, and if you don't want to spend three months doing it, you got to really figure <laughs> out how to do it fast. You know. Well, so. I've I've been um I've had a lot of you've heard the term of jack of many trades. Mm -hmm. I, I, every job that I've had that was not technically an acting job, mm -hmm. I look back now all these years later and I realize it was all part of acting. I had a job yeah. once where I had to read to the blind. Oh, cool! And that would help me with audiobooks, looking at lots of text and having to make sure that your, your accent is clear and, and, and audible and understandable uh, and, and, you know, coughing or hiccuping and knowing how it sounds to the person that's listening, mm -hmm. that, that just helps me with it. And then I, I still have the job. I, I can't really call it a job because I don't get paid for it, but for the last <laughs> 25 years, okay. I've been a volunteer storyteller in both the uni New York um, school system and LAUSD, LA, LA Unified School District. Oh, cool. Where I go into the schools and I read in the libraries to children their storybooks. Kids from maybe two, three years of age up to about well, 10, 11, I guess. Oh, that's yeah. fun. That's cool. Yeah. And you just I do it for volunteer. It, wow. Starting with a group called Screen Actors Guild Book Pals, okay. uh, started by uh, Barbara Bain many huh. years ago. From, you may remember from Space 1999. Oh, yeah. Many other I remember yeah. that show. 
that she yeah. uh, she started a book house. It's so anything that promotes literacy, especially in our youth, I'm on okay. board. So I joined back then, and I've been doing it for many years in New York until I moved here. Okay, and then found out that it was nationwide, so I started doing it here. Cool. But now, as of five years ago, uh -huh. that program is over. But I built up such a reputation for doing this that I do it as an independent agent. Cool. So, so uh, like I'll go to the WeHo library once a month on Saturday. They have a little house there, read to the kids there. Then there's a elementary school in my neighborhood. I go there, read at the elementary school. I write to the uh, the autistic children because uh, they were hard. It was hard to get readers for them. Cool. I've never done it before, but my mom had worked with the autistic children, being a retired nurse. Okay. So I figured my mom could do it and got a lot of satisfaction from it, maybe I can try it. And I did. Wow. And I liked it. And I was the only one that would go back. So, uh, yeah, that felt particularly gratifying to uh, do that because you're working with an audience that isn't necessarily right. going to be in rapture with your every speaking word. They're, you know, <laughs> concentration is right. with. Yeah, so to really pull them Of course, then, in, then, then while you're doing it, if you start to lose them, you're like, okay, I got to do something. Then you got to, like... Get them back there, like you know. And right. That's where my improvisational skills come in, you know. I mean, okay. Uh, juggling to noise to sound effects to juggling uh, movie faces. Uh, yeah, I'm not a prof I'm not really juggle. I mean, like one or two, like a tennis ball. Right. Two tennis balls in this hand while I'm touching my ear, or I'll do something like uh, use something flat, like. Uh, Anything like a book or a magazine or okay. let's say this poster. Oh, it's too light. I need something heavier. I know. I'll go in my kitchen. All right, we need something to juggle. A cutting board. <laughs> All right, now let's imagine. Let's up the ante. Let's uh, let's make you juggle a plate. So if you drop it, it's gonna smash. Oh, that's cool. And so Ooh. the kids are busy focusing on this while I'm over here doing this or closing my eyes, making it seem scary. Oh, you know, or falling asleep. They like it because all they're waiting for me to do is drop it, <laughs> you know? Right, and it never does. So, nah, nah. Um, That's so cool. You, but can you do it on a Brisbane. unicycle? <laughs> you know what? I love bicycles. I grew up... In New York, driving around uh, Central Park every weekend with my friends in our 10 speeds and 5 speeds, just going all the way around. Because they would close, close it to vehicular traffic on the weekends. Oh, cool. So you could go to Central Park and do the loop, you know. Um, and they got a lot of exercise to this day. I still love bicycles. That's although neat. I think I'm going to possibly get uh, an electric one. So <laughs> Those are the thing. Have you tried one? No racism anytime. Don't be a dick. Now that's good. I made this. I got a pizza box and I cut it and got some paper out of my printer and I just this I'm gonna make a couple of others and strategically right, place this. You can see I, I love art. I'm an artist. I was an artist long before I ever uttered a single syllable as an actor. Ooh. In visual fact, artist. I went to the Yes, I went to the High School of Music and Art and Performing Arts, now known as the LaGuardia School. They made a movie about it called Fame. Oh many, yeah, many I remember that ago. show. Yeah. 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 I um uh, I was uh I auditioned for the uh, music department with my cello. You play the cello? I... Yeah, back Dude. in the Hold on. Okay, sorry. <laughs> long, long time ago. Ta da. Wow, look at that. You kept it's a nice it one very too. Good yeah. Wow. It's a nice show. Still like yeah. Well, in wow. fact, um, my character, when you watch my Star Trek show, Captain Hardinger plays the cello. And <laughs> he carries it around with him everywhere. So when he's on the bridge, he's got his cello with him. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I love that. Because this, this is how I pitch the show. I say, it's a Star Trek fan series, but it's... Um, Oh no, I forgot what it is. Oh shit. I'm blanking out. I, I used to have it. It's part 
part Star Trek, part comic book, part Elvis movie. <laughs> <laughs> so, a hunk, hunk of sci-fi. Wow. Yeah. Because, well, all, most of the actors in it also are musicians because they're, I, I pick them, I pick my musician friends, you know, and then ask them if some of them are actually trained actors that are very good. Um, then some other of them are complete newbies as actors, and in which case it's just like casting where I just say, I find somebody I think is going to work. And then I just, it, then it's up to me as the director to make them feel comfortable. And then I'm just like, well, we're just going to just play yourself and just amp it up a little. And then we do a jillion takes, right? And then mm -hmm. all it takes is that one good take. If, if nine out of 10 of them are crap, but one of them's good, that's the one you use. And so they end up, even my wife's in the show. She's Chef Bev. I had to twist her arm to do it. But then I'm, she's the captain's um, uh, personal chef. And the scene that we did was he was complaining. He drinks chai tea. Uh -huh. And he was complaining that his chai didn't have enough heat in it. Did, like, and he was complaining, like, did you use real cayenne peppers or did you use cayenne powder? And it's this whole gag that goes on where they're arguing. And basically, it's just me and my wife arguing, just like we do in real life. Yeah. But <laughs> we amp it up a little. And it came out super good. Like, she pretty much upstaged me in that scene completely. You know, but see, now you have this treasured moment that the two of you captured forever. I think that's beautiful. Yeah. Wow. So it's wow. like that. So it's and that one. Well, that was different because we, we were in the same room. So I was directing her right in the green screen room. So it wasn't by Zoom. So it made it a little easier. But anyways, it's like that. And the show, the thing is, the show is like a is kind of a parody of Star Trek. So it's comedy and it's got some music in it. And, but it's got drama too. And then what I do mm -hmm. is um, it's all the original series. So I take clips from the original series and then have new actors interact with them. And then what happens is sometimes I can't find a clip where, you know, like Mr. Spock is saying what I want him to say, you know, or Scotty is or whatever. So instead what I'll do is I'll take a comic book shot. Sort of, it's almost like you're doing a, um, uh, storyboard. You just mm -hmm. you do a comic book shot, and then I have a voice actor imitate Scotty, for example. But my like JP has a really good Scotty. You can't even tell the difference. It sounds exactly like him. So oh, JP oh says Scotty is Scotty yeah. as a comic book, but because the show is is so surreal and and just off the cuff, it works perfectly when you flip the comic book suddenly and then out. It just gives you that really weird surreal vibe and it totally works and then it does what it's supposed to do because that's the only way i can get scotty to say a particular line because he never said it in real life so i have comic book scotty say it and it works great I so anyway memorial service oh you One did, of the first wow. things I did. james yeah, Duhan. Um, yeah i even have i still have the placard it's here someplace probably packed oh, away cool. but it had a an image of him and it said his final voyage and uh and there was uh, people got up and spoke, and it was very emotional. But uh, wow. my, my manager then had got me into it, so I, I I hit the ground running when I when I landed here. So arrived. Um, wow. So yeah, I, I, it was that was nice. And then I I Michelle Nichols, you know, we mm -hmm. got her. Yeah. For an episode of that which is amazing. Um, right. Yeah, folks. Uh, uh, Michelle Nichols is in Space Command. I don't know if you guys caught that. That's what we were talking about right now. Yeah. Lieutenant um, Uhura herself is in Space Command, so now you got to watch it. If you're a Trekkie, you have to watch it now. Absolutely. <laughs> there we go. We, we're going to be doing this at the end of our interview. But that's, I mean, it's good to know we can get that ready. Yeah. yeah, yeah so, I, I, wow. Um, did, then did you, um, so did you get to talk to her or meet her at all? Uh, didn't get to talk to her but she was involved in something she was she was on space i think i was there that day oh no they went to her house oh cool no yeah yeah i think i think they went to her house and they shot like around her no no i wasn't no so no, she lives in la 
she had lived in LA, yes. Wow, cool. Yeah. yeah. Wow, I was in LA. Neat. I don't know exactly where, but yeah, somewhere in LA. Yeah. That's neat. Yeah. yeah. Wow, that's and neat. And I followed George George Takei on a on a on a Instagram. Oh, cool. I, when I was on Facebook, I followed him. In. He's hilarious. Um, yeah, he is. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I, I love this. And Walter Koenig, um, I uh -huh. actually did meet in, in New York many years ago. Um, very humble, quiet, unassuming person. Um, I, I just, I just like people that are approachable like that, you know. And I'm, right. for you, do you know who I am? I, that, oh, that, I am Walter you know, Koenig. Yeah, of the it's just quadratrica yeah. Do you not do you not know what that is? <laughs> so I think I'm one of these guys is going to get one of those Star Trek shirts, like the one you have behind you. I'll oh, probably yeah. get mine in blue, and I'm gonna maybe get some uh, somebody in the costume department to get my ears. Speaking of Star Trek blue. actors, um, yeah. Tim Russ and I are going to do an interview pretty soon. He plays Tuvok on um, Voyager, Star Trek Voyager. Yeah, yeah. I know my my yeah. manager, my ex manager, actually knew him. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I, I don't want to name drop, but I but if I told if I dropped her name to him, he'd know. Oh yeah, you know her. Just, well, yeah, 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 yeah. But it's okay to name drop once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, know, uh -huh. I just you, 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 you interview an LA actor. That's all they see to do is like, oh yeah, do you know, no, 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 no. If you, are you plugged oh, yeah. in? Oh, God, oh, God, he didn't know, he didn't know. Yeah, I mean, I tweet, I did a tweet, and he responded to it. Yes. Actually, speaking of tweets, I did do a tweet, <laughs> and Brent Spiner. Not only did he respond to it, he pinned it to the top of his Twitter page for like three hours. Wow, <laughs> you. Yeah, you like all you. You're you're like Mr. Sci-Fi. Uh, I see the Orville in front of you. That's oh yeah. Oh man, do you do you like the Orville? Yeah, well, the Orville's I, I, great. I, I I I've been I actually think I had an audition for that show. Really? A couple of things I auditioned for I did, I didn't get, but I still you know. Um, do you know, I'm do you know any of the actors? Uh. Personally, no, no, I have no of them, but I don't know any personally. And a few that I do know personally, I, I don't name drop, <laughs> you know. Oh, you know, it's so insane. You know, this man, I mean, what's it going to get me, you know? Oh, yeah, free pass on the, on the minor, I don't. I, um, I, I well, try to. Okay, here's, I do name drop too. That's, but the thing is, is the, it's, the trick is not to take it too seriously. Mm -hmm. Like if when you're name dropping, if you, if you just, you just, if you're doing it playfully and you're like, well, I'm name dropping, I'm, I know I'm name dropping and I'm just doing it as opposed to I'm so important because I'm <laughs> name dropping this person. <laughs> it's like, yeah, so I was telling Eva Mendez, like, hey, hey, Denzel, hang on a second, let me finish the story. So Eva, like I was saying, is like, oh, yeah, hey, Brad, can I get another drink of you? You're like, stop, <laughs> stop it. Just, just, just stop, stop, you know. So then I said, Angelina, please, I, I'm, I'm a married man. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Can you do um, Rodney Dangerfield? <laughs> Ah, that's funny. I, I, when I, when I came here and I couldn't get an agent, I, 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 I felt like I was channeling a, a Rodney Danger. But I tell you, I, I, the guy calls me a baboon. He thinks I'm his mother. <laughs> so yeah, I get no respect, no respect at all. Yeah, yeah, I like that guy. Yeah. That oh guy. boy. Now it starts. Yeah. Do you do any stand-up comedy or stuff or improv stage improv stuff or things like that? I tried it one time on a drunken, a partially drunken dare. I was in <laughs> Soho, Manhattan, many, many moons ago. We're talking the 1980s. And um, they had one of those open mic nights. Mm -hmm. So we're sitting in an audience and anybody with enough, you know, liquid courage can get up there and just get, get five minutes. So we're sitting in the front. Some of my friends are kind of heckling, you know, doing shots. And I'm not, I'm not the greatest drinker they finally urged me to get up on stage and i get up and i'm like and you know i guess there's something to say for 
there's something to be said for when you're really, really smashed. You really are fearless. You don't know what an ass you're making of yourself <laughs> or you don't care. So you just right. go up there and that freedom gives you the, uh, the courage to just say whatever. And I, I don't even remember what I said, but I remembered whatever it was in my intro, it made everybody howl. And when <laughs> I heard that laughter, I looked at my, ah, y'all think that shit is funny? Like, where do you hear this? And I <laughs> went into this tirade and they, uh, I went on for more than five minutes, but as long as you're killing it, right. they're not going to yank you off stage, you know? Mm -hmm. I don't, so I think after like maybe 10, 15 minutes, there's somebody said, okay, come on, give the rest of us a chance. It's like, uh, you had your chance. But they pulled me off and I said, wow. And somebody came over and said, you know, if you could do this sober, <laughs> you could really um, make some money. And uh, wow. I, ironically, many, 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 many years later, I auditioned for and I booked a role on a new television series, which hasn't started because of... Uh, the pandemic, but okay. I got cast in a show called Vaude Villains. Oh, cool. Which is a sketch comedy show. 12 actors, 12 comedians, most of whom are actually stand ups that have done this for years and years and years. Some are comedic actors. And I'm probably one of the only, if not one of two people in the entire cast that's not done stand up, would not consider uh. themselves a stand up. But now I'm a comedy writer and a oh, comedy cool. performer in this group. And if we. Uh, get together and get this pilot done. You, I uh, should be coming soon to a screen near you. <laughs> I happen to know a an Orville super fan who lives in Sydney. Oh, uh, yeah, well, that's where he is. Oh, really? Yeah. I wonder if they. If it'd be funny yeah, if they lived in the same apartment wow. <laughs> complex. My friend's name is Elise, but now oh. I call her Saucy Sis because <laughs> we've decided that we we were both. Uh, we our test tubes were next to each other on the mothership, <laughs> <laughs> and then she got deployed to Australia, and I got deployed to Seattle. And then the idea was to see whether we would somehow find each other again decades later. And because of the Orville, we have. Mm -hmm. So, wow, wow, <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> wow! So, I think we've covered everything from the sublime to the ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. What else is there? Let's see. Well, we haven't gotten into politics yet. <laughs> oh, oh, so I so this really isn't just about space command because I no, I, this I, is I, about I, anything you want to talk about. And oh, like when you're talking to me, it, we go on wild tangents. Because I was saying, do you call the stream of consciousness channel? It's mm -hmm. like, yeah, man. you got you're it not with his vibe, bro. If you're not here with me, if you're not digging what I'm saying, then why are you here, man? I mean. What's the point why, of it all? You know, what that's I mean? exactly why? why are we here? Let's. I yes. mean, would somebody please tell me so I can I was just start doing like, what I'm supposed to do? <laughs> Bertrand Russell. Yeah, it's like a name drop. I was talking to him and Aldous Huxley the other day. And I was, okay. What is the meaning of life? And then Nietzsche said, "Who cares?" So. <laughs> See, you so are a comic. Uh, I. I yeah, it's it's for me. I see the way these people, these other comedians, they or funny people, they write their stuff down. It's rehearsed. And they do a set. I'm very just organic. I you talk, you talk to me, and if something's funny comes out, it comes out. It's it's like that's a, okay. You know, it, it it could hit or it could miss, but it's not something like no two shows are the same. I'm like the snowflake of comedians. You understand what I'm saying over right. here? Yeah. Yes. I hear you. So, so one day it's shit, next day it's feathers. Genius award, buddy. You and I, we see eye to eye. I like that. <laughs> My kind of guy. Because just like Jimmy Stewart in Rear Window, the, right. the streets are watching. The streets is watching, homeboy. The streets is watching. People are peeping. Once you step out your doorstep, you have to assume you're being watched. If not by another person, by a camera, by a video recorder, something, rec so you're being seen. So you pick your nose and scratch your crack at your own wrist. But no, somebody's watching. <laughs> somebody's watching. So, so all you dog walkers that don't like to pick it up, pantomime. <laughs> It'll get Hand you out of mine, a ticket. Yeah. <sighs> I think we can edit that part of the interview. <laughs> all right, we're editing that. He's talking about poop. 
Talking about poop. Yeah, we, we edited out the poop part. Sorry, guys, you missed that, but it just wasn't. This is a family show, and that was just a bit too far over the edge. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's that's another thing about comedy. I'm, I, I can be blue, but right. I think if I were to really carve out a career in this, I think it's possible to be funny without being profane. Yeah. And it's not to say that I don't think profane comics are not funny. You right. know, some of the bluest ones out there I've listened to and enjoyed from uh, Lenny Bruce to Richard Pryor to Dave Chappelle. Yeah. Um, the blue streak, you know, but I really think um, that for me, the comedy that, that appeals to me is the one that just makes you think, you, you, right. you, you know, um, uh, George Carlin's a perfect example of that, you know, mm -hmm. um, he, he, he talks about the way the, the government is and the way people are and, and how we, we try to make things nice and we euphemism, he's euphemism, he's shell shock, turns right. to post-traumatic stress syndrome, you know, all these extra syllables and say the right. same thing. It's, I like it when you can make me laugh, but I, at the same time I go, oh, wow, I, I think I learned something. Gosh, well, I didn't know. You're familiar with Trevor Noah, I assume. Yes, yes, my um, South African brother. Did you happen to see, of course, everybody's pissed when he announced he's, he's ending his show or he's leaving the show. Well, no, but no, then no, he, no. Did, he did an episode where he and the uh, traffic guy did a gag where the traffic guy was giving him shit about leaving the show and not telling him about it and all this. It was really good. Wow. Because he was really wow. laying it on him, you know. So, and that's what's kind of cool about Trevor's show these days is he has a lot of um, guest comics come in and do their little spiel, you know, so that's cool. I don't know. Maybe he's auditioning them or something on camera. I think it's, it's nice if we'd reach you know? back and pull people. I ever said if I ever, if my star shone ever so brighter <laughs> and I was in a position to hire people, um, I would definitely get my friends a, a break. And, and it's not because of nepotism or favoritism. It's because I know that they're hardworking performers. I know they're talented. And I, I trust in their abilities. And I, we get along. There's so many people out there that are talented, that are jerks. Why right. work with a jerk when you can work with people? We don't know how much time we have left on this earth. Right. It could be five weeks, five days, or five years, or five decades. We don't know. Right. So why not spend whatever time you have alive, being the best person you can, doing right. the best work possible. Yeah. So I'm totally with you, you on that. Yeah. yeah. I, I just have no time. I, and it's not to say that um, if I don't want to work with you, that you're a bad person, I'm above you. It's not about above or below. It's mm -hmm. just vibing, different energies. Right. You know? So right. You I mean, yeah. I... Connection, we, could, we have one, and we can work on that. We don't? We don't. It's just it is what it is. Mm-hmm. The, the oil doesn't ask the water, why don't we meld? It just does. It says, hey, you know, we're not, okay, we'll just coexist. Um, yeah. And, 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 and secondly, I, what I share with you and whoever's listening is just for our non private, non-commercial enjoyment slash edutainment. Um, don't come for me. Don't look me up. <laughs> I'm not going to engage anybody <laughs> regardless of your, your yeah. affiliations and your politics. These are my feelings and mine alone. And as far as I know, I'm still allowed to have them. So, yeah. That having been well, said. Though, you, as an actor, though, especially if you have a certain notoriety, I mean, that people listen to what you say. Mm -hmm. And so, so you can, I, I mean, you can, if you offer your opinion, it has a little more weight behind it, right? And that's a, uh, that's a certain power that you have. So my, my, from my point of view, it's like, well, if I have this power, let's call it, then why not use it, but use it for good, right? Well, that's why I try, I, I, I educate, and I, I've been combating illiteracy for the last 25, almost 30 years. Uh, and, I, and I work with children especially because I realize if you can catch them early in their development, Mm -hmm. You can give them skills that they'll carry with them for the rest of their life. I became fascinated with the written word when I was a little kid. My, my dad's older brother, gave my uncle, gave me a comic book. I think it was a Justice League or a, a comic book. And I read it cover to cover, and I loved the art. I loved the story. And, I, and I, then I started getting more and more and more, and I've got a collection that's probably worth some money now. But, um, cool. but I, I, I like the, the, the world that 
comics and then eventually books brought me to. And, and then when I started reading Ray Bradbury and Isaac Asimov and Ursula Le Guin, um, oh. I, I was like, wow. Uh, I really became a fan of, of, of uh, science fiction because I saw a world that was better than the one that I was living in. Mm -hmm. That's why people like Michelle Nichols was, was very important to see her on Star Trek. When, you know, mm -hmm. when this, like 12, 13 year old kids looking at a TV show mm -hmm. that takes place in the future. Oh, black people are still living in the future. There is a future that includes us, you know? Right. So, um, yeah. My lifelong uh, love of, uh, of uh, science fiction began there. And, and, and then when I did my deep dive into like uh, the mechanics of the show, I found out that at one point, Nichelle Nichols was the, was not a, a regular, serious regular. You know, mm -hmm. b being this early 60s, America still having this problem with race back then, she was getting paid a day rate, a day player, and it was ridiculous. So finally, uh, it was Leonard Nimoy that stepped up and went to the show's producers and said, no, we want... She should be paid just like the rest of us and get a, a regular contract. And they were like, they were balking at the idea. He said, well, if you don't, then I'll leave. They didn't That's call a great story. Bluff. They didn't call his bluff. So Leonard Nimoy, yeah. I just, I just like people that, that are, are fair and stand up, you know, even when it can right. cost them something, you know. Plus, he, I mean, he, he also has the guts to do that. Like, I know, like, he refused to be in one of the Star Trek movies because he felt like the role for Spock was too insignificant. So he's like, you know what? Anybody could say these lines. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be Spock. And in fact, what they did was they had some other characters say what were originally Spock's lines. I'm trying to remember which one it was. I think it was Star Trek five and no Star Trek mm. six, maybe no. Well, whatever it was, one of the movies. Yeah. Right at the opening. All the he directed were really good ones. <laughs> He's yeah. A, he was, yeah. And you know what? Martin Luther King actually convinced her to stay, too. At one point, she wanted to quit. And right. it was Martin Luther King Jr. That, that talked to her. I'm sure you may have heard of that story, but mm -hmm. he convinced yeah, her yeah. to stay. Yeah. So between him and, and, and Leonard Nimoy, I, I'm glad that she stayed, too. Yeah. Um, and Angelique Scott plays my daughter. Oh, uh, cool. You know, I just interviewed Angelique like a couple weeks ago. Oh, she's on the show. She's she. You can find her interview. Yeah, she and I are next to because she plays my. When I started in the show, I had my hair was black, and I, you know, I was a regular Lieutenant Chilton. We did an episode twenty five years in the future, and uh, they were concerned like how I'm going to age. I said, "Don't worry, I'll just stop dyeing my hair." <laughs> and so, um, that's but, what, yeah. if I if I didn't dye my hair, it would be about that gray too. This yep, is there me. we go. <laughs> And that's her. Oh, cool. I got to get one of those family trees. Speaking of who you and Angelique, uh, yeah. I see you're right next to Ethan, too. Yeah. Ethan Dowell. What a lovely guy. Yeah. He, um, I met a lot of people in this business. I've been at this professionally since 84. I joined SAG. Yeah, mm -hmm. 84. Uh, and AFTRA, well, more recently, and um, Equity in the 90s, I think. Mm -hmm. But uh, so I, I've met, what I'm, the point I'm making is I've, I've met a lot of actors on a lot of shows. Hi. And um, he's a stand up guy. He's, yeah. he's very, very, he's good at what he does. And uh, he's humble. Yeah, he's very he's humble. Helpful. Yeah. He's very helpful. Mm -hmm. And um, and he's not full of himself. He's just yeah. absolutely, you know. And 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 although he's doing Space Command with us, he's also done you know a ton of other things that I see him popping in all the time. I saw him on one of my favorite shows. He was playing the bad guy. He was part. He was done the Walking Dead. Yeah, he's Walking Dead. Captain, Captain Marvel or Ms. Mm -hmm. Marvel. And I saw him as part of people trying to collect her there. And I saw him popping. And then with all that stuff. I know people that would get that same amount of uh, work and they'd be all like this. Oh, Nathaniel, how are you? Like, what are you doing? And I'm, you know, and putting all these airs on. That's yeah, not I'm glad I somehow I'm immune. I, I don't come across those people. I guess I probably put out this energy like I wouldn't put up with it 
or I would mm. immediately yeah. think, oh, okay, well, next. <laughs> my, I would do my version of snobbiness to them, which is basically like, okay, <laughs> you're yeah. obviously not being a real person, so. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's sad, though, because I've seen people that were started off like Ethan and then become like evil Ethan, you know, or, or like slightly like a, 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 ni- a less nice version, which makes uh-huh. me think, is there something about the business that engenders that type or, or lends itself to that type of behavior? Because, you know, like, why does one be, have to be that way to think they have to yeah. either get on top or stay on top? Right. Is it possible to be a nice person, humble, well, approachable, maybe even is, a Christian? And- yeah. Okay. Do you, do you know Brian? Brian McClure? He's another one. He's another. Uh, yeah. Brian and Ethan are buddies. Those two guys yeah. are just the best warm-hearted guys. I mean, they're like, I love them both. I do, you too. Know. In fact, I wanted to be the, I, Brian ran into me in 2018. I was in New York. We were there at the same time. Different reasons, of course. And when we found out we were both in the same city, I was like, hey, let's meet. We met up on the Upper East Side. We're having pizza. And I was talking to him. because said, I haven't seen you since we shot so-and-so. And so like he's like, uh, no, I hear you moved to Atlanta. He's like, yeah, yeah. You they both go. live in Atlanta now. And uh, yeah. all these years later, I kicked myself. He he said you should come down. He even said you could stay could stay with him and, and Ethan. They had like you know a spare room. And I was like, eh, I don't know. You know, I I'm so used to living alone, and now I gotta have roommates. I mean, I know you guys are wonderful, but I, I'm gonna, you know, I'm, I'm Walter Matha. I'm the cranky old man. And, <laughs> Where the ladder? Where's the toothpaste? And where's my ketchup? And I, I, you fucking kids, I just, I, I just, I, I, I said, nah, nah. And now, all these years later, I'm thinking, wow, I have somebody in my building now that's he and his girlfriend. Oh, I'm sorry, his fiance. Are, um, I said, they're moving. I said, oh, where are you moving? I just got to know you guys. Yeah, we're I, to Atlanta. Atlanta. I think they're married now. Yeah. My friends? Oh, no, Ethan's oh, no. wife. Oh, yeah, 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 they've been married. Yeah, I was talking about okay. somebody in my building. Oh, okay, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, they did, I did meet Athena, and yes, they, they, they're they a lovely couple. I love yeah. all of them, you know? Yeah. And if I if the offer is still good, who knows? I may just... Uh, all right, be- Ethan McDowell. Yeah, <laughs> Ethan, Athena, Brian, and me, yeah. Oh, well, Brian... Brian and I are a hatch, have a plan hatching. Uh, Brian Brian was in a movie. He got a starring role in a movie in a feature film. Yeah, I and loved I it. Dropped. I saw. It. Oh, the one yeah. on HBO, right? Yeah. In other words, in other yeah. words, I've watched it a bunch of times. In fact, yeah. I've been I've been like pestering um, uh, the the producer Patrick Perez Vidori. I've been mm-hmm. like, dude, you have to market this movie more. It's like no people need to watch. Everybody I know who watches it loves it. Yeah, you know? but they had to be told about it. If they if they had more, I don't know, more press, more PR, more something to yeah. get, get it out. Because like I you thought said, it was everyone brilliant. Was, also, yeah. I really love um, Eddie Gonham. Like she is so she's she's um, she plays the cook. I, we we can't spoil it though. Well, we just yeah, say yeah. she's she's a Latina in the movie, of one of the two main Latinas in the movie, Andy Gonham. Yeah, he plays um, Karina, I think. Right? Is that her name, Karina? Good, good, good acting. Good, good. Yeah, and the cinematography. Well, oh, the, 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 the cinematography in that movie what? was so good, and the it's acting, the script, and all the what? acting was top notch. And you know what? We know what I found out. Patrick told me they de- they did that movie for three hundred thousand dollars. Wow, looks it like was it that good. A lot. Wow, that movie looks like it cost several million dollars. Yeah, and the, also the soundtrack, the the music they put in it was excellent. So I was like checking all the boxes: cinematography, absolutely excellent; soundtrack, great; great mm-hmm. script; all the acting, not just the stars, but all of them were really good. Yeah, supporting you know? everyone. They put and it's a positive yeah. movie, you know. It's like a family movie. Also, it celebrates Latino culture. It's got I picked up on that really quick. Like the Latinos in the movie are the heroes, and Brian, the star, is actually the clown. <laughs> you know, and um, so I'm like, there's all these things that are great about this movie. I, like we gotta figure out a way to promote it somehow. 
So I'm still uh, in, in behind the scenes figuring out a way to do it. Okay. I well, the same- <laughs> my all time. My all-time world record longest interview was three hours. So we're like at almost two. So we got plenty of time. What? <laughs> two hours? Oh, my gosh. Yeah. See, this is what happens. We just start yakking and pr- the time flies. <laughs> yeah. Wow. I got I to gotta, I gotta learn how to either use, 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 short, use smaller words or shorter sentences. That was a line that Jack Klugman said to Tony Randall in uh, The Odd Couple. All right, Felix, so let's please. see. Let's see if we can do it. Um, <clears throat> small words and short sentences. All right. Well, time to go to bed. Wow. I just did a voiceover, and that was the title of the voiceover. Oh. Yeah, I was in New York. Time to go to somebody wrote a lullaby and they liked my voice and wanted me to do the uh, the uh, thing and then uh, that turned into a bigger production and somebody else wanted to bring a dancer in and then they then it was a soundtrack and then I had a recording session in New York and then when I got back out here they wanted to so I had to do some stuff over the iPhone and then they sent it in an MP3 and they cleaned it up it's amazing what you guys can do even when you're not there anymore so there's any chance we could time. hear we could hear your version of time to go to bed. Uh, I would have to. No, I, I don't know if I could. No, I, I have mean, my. Vo- no, no, I, I mean, I, in other words, could you do it right now? Oh, we mean live. Yeah. Uh, I mean, just you, say time to go to bed or something like that. Oh. Uh, in the sh- in the character of the show. It was more like a. It was. It was only me as a voiceover, and it's just like okay. it was like a lullaby. Imagine is it time to go to bed. Oh. Rest, rest your weary head. There's nothing to be afraid of. There are no monsters in your bed. No, it's just fluffy clouds and stars mm. and billowy puffs of smoke mm. to drift you off into the arms of Morpheus. Mm. And then... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, I may wondered- have to believe that. Oops. Well, I- Seriously, what happens if one of us drops an F bomb or whatever? We get out that. Wow. <laughs> we so and wait then... a minute. What? We're still in the same time zone because you said you're in Seattle, right? Yeah. So it's like almost nine o'clock. Okay. So all right. It's so not like for a second I, I said no. Wait. If he's in New York, eight, nine, ten, eleven forty-five. He, oh, God, no. Why do you you're think close. I was in New York? Why would I be in New York? I knew you were. Sound like someone York. from New York. I live in Seattle. Internet <laughs> shirt yoga? Got that right. Inter- One of internet- the characters I play is the internet shirt yogi. Yogi. Oh. oh the, well, wow. the internet shirt yogi is, pr- practices internet shirt yoga. In fact, there's Sanskrit for it. You want to know what internet shirt yoga is in Sanskrit? Yes. Pranakasha Pushtakali Yutika Jit Yoga. Okay. Say that again. Pranakasha Pushtakali Yutika Jit Yoga. Find the shirts oh, on the so internet to conquer it. Yoga. Pranakasha Pushtakali Yutika Jit Yoga. Find the shirt on the internet to conquer it. Yoga. I love that film. Uh, yep. So many shows. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. We got to wrap it up. It's almost yeah. bedtime. So what what shall we pitch besides Space Command? Because you, you got a lot well, of... Also, besides uh, your pending stand-up comedy... Um, oh, I'm really excited about that because, like I said, it's the first time in my entire career where I'm uh, not only just a, a, a comic and being paid to be funny, but I'm also a writer. I'm, every, every comic on the show is a, a contributor to the actual uh, script. So cool. we do one master master sketch that has like all 12 of us in it and then whoever has the best pitch for that week gets two or three sketches of their demises so i picked up final draft and i'm now writing uh the stuff that i want to be in and they Fine. like one of my sketch i don't want to tell you which one it is no spoilers here but i i did this really cool take on a james bond that's all i've got to say oh cool as, and oh, uh, they loved it you yeah. know what um actually what you could do have you heard of TikTok? 
Yeah, the kids are telling me about it. Uncle Matt, you should get on it, Uncle Matt. You're really funny, Uncle You'd Matt. be good. You should monetize. You should monetize. I don't know. Or Instagram. You could also do this. Instagram is sort of becoming the same thing as TikTok. Like mm -hmm. you could do your little... Your little, you could do little one minute or two minute little sketches. Uh, I mean, all and uh, so many, so many of them are just improv. You know, it doesn't even have to be that well set up. You just turn on your phone and you talk to your phone. Or you could, uh, you could take clips from this interview and just start <laughs> putting them on Instagram as little one minute things. You know, yeah, there's a lot I'll of things say. you do. Because, uh, like, I mean, you've got. Yeah, you got the quick wit. You got a jillion different accents and characters that you can just pull up, right? So, I mean, it's almost like you don't even need any content. You could just just keep going randomly through all the characters you know, and that would be entertaining enough. Would you be my app? Would you be my the, the Abbot to my Costello? Sure, would you be I can my do that. Sam Laurel? I need a straight okay. man. I need a I need a straight man. Tell hey, me all, honey. Look. <laughs> I'll tell you how straight I am. Like my wife accuses me of being gay, and I say, "Hun, <laughs> I'm not gay. I'm straight as an eight-inch stick." <laughs> <laughs> wow! <laughs> For some reason, that that doesn't that doesn't quell her fears. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's just. Like I came out of the cinema the other day. I was watching an, uh, the new movie Grows, and somebody looked, saw me, went, hmm. <laughs> and I guess they were expecting me to have a reaction, like, "Oh, you wanted me to 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 to, to answer you or to qualify why I came out of the movie?" <laughs> That's not going to happen. You see, I, I I've, I've taken a very um, what's that actor's name? Oh, a very uh, Hop Hopkins uh, um, approach to it. Uh, Anthony Hopkins, and I'll leave you with this. He was quoted as saying, and I, I may be wrong, but I think it was his quote. What other people think of me is none of my concern. I am what I am, and I do what I do. And I like that. I don't care. I really don't. I mean, it's nice if you like what you see or what I do or how I do it or anything else I do. But if you don't, if it's not for you, you have the choice. You can do three things. You can turn the volume down. You can change the channel or you can off. Yep. <laughs> I think it was something I used to worry about. And now that I'm in, in this decade, I, I, it's almost laughable, you know, yeah. that we could be in a society where we, we can't make a move. We, we, we want, we, we prize, we value uh, authenticity and independence, right. but then when anybody actually makes an attempt to do just that, they're so worried about it being subjected to public scrutiny. And then, so it's like we all want to be that badass, but no one wants to actually take the slings and arrows that come with being the badass. You can't yeah. have it both ways, right? You, you have know? to. Well, things have changed, though. I think with in, with YouTube and Instagram and all this, now people love to see you as a real person. And see your flaws, you know, and oh, it's not you're, you're whereas gonna, old school is like you always have to be you like when you're an actor, you have to maintain your image and whatever your image is, you got to make sure that you're always projecting that in any public type of situation, yada, yada, yada. But nowadays, I mean, it really seems like the most successful actors now are the ones who can do this right now where we just freestyle and we be ourselves and everybody knows that we're not performing. We're just being in ourself, but that's why people yeah, are so fascinated by it. Come on. Why can I not come up with my opening line? <sighs> that's why I cannot be a real actor. Once the cameras roll, I'm like, uh, I can't remember what I'm supposed to say. Uh. <laughs> yeah, I had that concern when I hit fifty-five. I started thinking, you know, memory. Yeah, fifty-five is in the rear win rear view window for me. How are we going to be able to remember lines? Because I started off in the theater. You know, the very first job I ever did was was on on stage, and and uh, I still get more oh. satisfaction from theater than I do film. But it's so much I different. Get more, but I get more cheddar from film and TV than I okay. do on stage. I've so. got it. I came to me. Thank yeah. you, sir. 
Rear Admiral Victor of Owings Lair. What can I do for you, ma'am? Okay, that's about as good as I can do an RP. Right that now. works. With a pipe in your mouth, you look like that actor that was in The Ghost of Mrs. Muir. Man, am I dating myself. That okay. was a television show in the 60s. And this woman inherited a house. Or she, she, she roomed at a house with her. I think she had a son. And uh, her deceased son. And it was a dead sea captain who haunted the place. The ghost. He was the ghost. The ghost of Mrs. Muir. Ooh. You look it up. You resemble him when you had that pipe in your mouth. My thank Proper you. English. Oh, a question. Did, did you ever do any Shakespeare in your career as a stage actor? Interesting you should say that. Many moons ago, well, well to be precise, about 2010, um, I was wishing a friend and fellow table member of Mark's Table um, cool. happy birthday. Um, and when I wished her happy birthday, she wrote back, oh, thank you, Nathaniel. That's for Sarah Elise. She wrote back, oh, thank you. That's really nice of you. Oh, by Nathaniel, by the way, would you happen to know any, do you do Shakespeare? Are you classically trained? And I wrote back, why, of course I am. What the question is, you know, yeah, yes. Why do you ask? Well, I have a friend of mine who's doing a, a show and he really needs a Shakespeare. I said, you can't find a Shakespeare actor in LA. <laughs> black one, a black one. I, there's the rub. I didn't know it was that hard to find. But anyway, long story short, she gives me his information. I think I, I wish happy birthday on a Thursday, on a Wednesday, on a Thursday I auditioned, on a Friday I got the role. And I wound up being cast as Lord Marcellus Wallace in the production of Pulp Shakespeare. Pulp Imagine Shakespeare. if you will, Quentin Tarantino and William Shakespeare get together to do Pulp Fiction in Shakespearean times. And I am a contaminant. <laughs> and yes, we not only won the Fringe Festival, in 2010, 2012, I live here in Los Angeles. But we took our show to New York, and I got to do it in front of my hometown. Cool. At the Soho Playhouse. And then when we won, we got an extra month stay at the uh, Cherry Lane. And we brought Pulp Shakespeare there. But prior to that, yes, I've done Othello. Okay. I played uh, Tristan and Tristan and Isolde. Um, but wait a minute, that's I, Wagner, right? Yes, so I've, I've bounced around is what I'm trying to say. I, I'm, I've, you know, I, I, uh, I, I, I'm, if you haven't noticed people, I'm, I'm quite verbose and I am. I, okay, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. So Tristan and Isolde, so do, you, do you mean you sang? Are you an opera singer? No, no, no. We just did little excerpts from, from like little scenes. It was, a, it was a, a, an afternoon of like little one acts, little, little things we did together because I was a part of a theater company back in New York called the New Perspectives Theater Company. Okay. I was working, and then I joined a 42nd Street Playhouse. So it was all like in the theater district on, on the West Side. So I, I immersed myself in all things um, Shakespearean, all things. I they did Moliere. Okay. You know? Have you ever done Merchant uh, of Venice? No. I read it, but no, I've not done it. Okay. But, uh, uh, I've always wanted Senor to do Senor Antonio. Many uh, a time and often the Rialto, you have rated me about my money. That's the one and, thing that's eluded me in my career. Shakespeare in the Park and, and Broadway. I've even done off-Broadway. Oh. I, I did big budget movies, low budget movies, uh, independents, student films, uh, television series, soap operas. I was on One Life to Live. Uh, oh, great. My children, uh, modeled, uh, did a Pepsi Cola commercial, did a Fostex pimple cream commercial. I did everything except I want to do, except I haven't done Broadway. <clears throat> and, um, yeah, I haven't done Broadway yet, yet. And I haven't done Shakespeare in a park. I'd love to do something in a Delacorte. Mm. Well, you know what I've been wanting to do on my channel for quite a while is I've been wanting to do some Shakespeare with a couple of other actors. We would do it all with green screens. And that we would just do a couple of scenes from whatever plays. And what I, originally what I wanted to do was do it, call it Shakespeare Trek, and Ooh. have it all do a Shakespeare scene, but have it all in Star Trek costumes and stuff. Behold, I have a weapon. Mm -hmm. 
A better never did itself sustain upon a soldier's thigh. I've seen the day that with this little arm and this good sword I've made my way through more impediments than twenty times your stock. But oh, vain boast. Tis not so now. Uh, sorry. Great. It's a little bit of a, a tell -o. Yes. Okay. Uh, did it. So like I, like I was doing, now, do you always do Shakespeare in a British accent? Uh, no, but you know, when you speak in that, that what's it called, that, that transatlantic, uh, there's a, there's, a, there's a word for it. I think, yeah, the, um, I know what you're talking about. It was sort of accent, the... I, well, one of my uh, junior high school teachers, uh, English teacher and a homeroom teacher, she actually, she reminded me of uh, Diane Carroll. That's the best way I can describe her. Classy, elegantly beautiful, um, and very, very insightful and intelligent and well-spoken. Mm. And she would always emphasize the importance of elocution and and pronunciation mm -hmm. and paying attention to the endings of words mm -hmm. so i was always and sometimes people still accuse me of speaking in a very professorial type of way mm -hmm. as if it were an affectation but this isn't i'm just a product of my education mm -hmm. and environment mostly so um and it stuck it stayed with me so I am. I still pronounce the endings of words. What are you doing? Nothing, honey. Nothing, as honey. As opposed to nothing, honey. Okay, I think about a half hour ago we were trying to wrap things up. Oh, <laughs> believe it my or not. God. <laughs> so okay, so you have a new com. Oh, I was going to ask you. So it's it's so when you do the show, it actually has a script, or is it more like an outline that you improv off of? When you guys are actually oh, shooting the villains, show, Vaude Villain, uh, Lisa Premise, as it was explained to me in our first and only, well, we had maybe two or three meetings, uh, cast meetings via Zoom. Uh, we would get, we, we would create the content, then we'd pull our get together like in a writers' room, much like the cast of like Sad Night Live does. Okay, uh, get together in a room and we throw out the ideas fast and furious, and then we vote on. And who who's is, is going to go that week, and then we rehearse those scenes, and then they're recorded like live, you know, with a well, studio you know, audience or something. Well, that would be the idea, but right now I think because of COVID, we're probably just trying to get the scenes done first, okay. and maybe just add canned laughter until we can actually get in front of an audience. Don't do that. I would rather just to like have no laughter. Right, just you don't even need a laugh it. track because the one Orville of the funny is. Shows there's lots of funny shows now. For example, which really surprised me, Young Sheldon is a great show if you haven't watched it. I haven't seen it. It's a spinoff from Big Bang Theory. I've seen that, yes. Yeah, so they take Sheldon and then, then they, they tell the story of his life when he was a kid. Mm -hmm. And it is really good. Really good. All the actors in it are great. Scripts are super good. They're like in their sixth season now, I think now. Oh. And uh, it surprised me. I thought it was going to be dumb, but it turned out to be a great show. Anyhow, that is a funny show, and there's no laugh track and there's no audience. You don't need to have a laugh track to do a funny show. Well, one of my favorite shows, and I, I'm slightly older than you, so I tend to go back further, was mm -hmm. uh, Faulty Towers. Oh, I love that show. Yeah, Done Jonathan no Cleese. Yeah, no laugh track whatsoever. I, I saw an interview with him, and, and he said the beautiful thing about not having a laugh track or, or a live audience is that you can just go on and, and people, they have to pay attention because they're laughing through the next line. So a lot of the, the jokes are missing. Because our show would be tr 10 times as long if we had to wait for people to stop laughing because there's so much laughter in it, you know? So right. we just we muddle through and people just laugh when they get it, and I, I, I like that. Yeah. Because I always think it should be organic. You know, right. when was, when the first time I went to a show with a live studio audience, I, I was surprised there was a applause. Like, oh, oh now? Okay, laugh. <laughs> How disingenuous is that? Yeah. You know, if you really are that funny, we don't need no sign. We need not know to laugh. Yeah. You bring the funny. I'll bring the laughter. Yeah. You just make me laugh. Of course, the thing is, to 
to do that, you'd have to do everything in one take. Like, what if you do five or six takes and they know the joke by then? Yes. But they probably just take their laughter from the first take and and splice mm-hmm. it in. But still. Or you allow people to improv like me. So every time it'd be funny because, see, you could take a simple line. Okay, I had an audition for a movie and this these are sides for an actual movie. Okay. But uh, – I'm not going to mention the movie or the product, but I'll just take a line from NDA. it. NDA. I, I don't know how to tell her. Now, that line, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven words, right? I could say, I don't know how to tell her. 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 So wherever you place the emphasis, you know? I, I, like, I don't know how to tell her. <laughs> It can be done so many different ways. When I know. you have an, a, an Armin Shimmerman or a Mark, Mark uh, Zikri, you're, you're in good hands because they can see all those little subtleties, all those little nuances that right. an actor brings to a role. A lot of times I feel, not a lot of times, but there, are, there have been moments where I've been underutilized, where I bring a certain level of gravitas to a role, mm-hmm. experience, Mm-hmm. And the act and the, the production team is just wants a warm body that can spout the lines. Yeah. And I'm like, wow. See, that's that, a scary that's a th- And that's a, that's a scary thing about film acting is you're completely at the mercy of the edit. Mm-hmm. Like you don't get to go in there and say, do that. I want that take and that take and that take. No, you just do your thing. You go away and you hope that they took your best takes. And sometimes know, it's even and the stitch them together in a way that's all. convincing. Yeah. Or when I have an emotional scene and one that requires that I show a lot of passion, maybe even cry, and I can cry on cue. Mm-hmm. But what it takes to get me there, that's not something that's a trick. So if you don't get it on that first try, and my eyes are dry at a second or a third or a fourth take, you know, you got you to gotta have a certain sensitivity of no, if, if this is a scene that's emotionally draining and the actor that's doing this is really digging deep to bring that to the surface, we got one chance to get this right. I remember reading about um, Jimmy Stewart doing a, It's a Wonderful Life. There was one scene where he had to show real desperation and sadness. Uh, he was on the verge of suicide, and he said mm-hmm. he'd never had a role where he had to play that kind of... Uh, pathos where he had to show that kind of remorse or that sadness and he right didn't know if on he the bridge it. right before he's gonna jump yes. right but he okay. finally managed to do it. he said he thought of all that could go wrong if he doesn't get this right he thought of all the people he'd be letting down and all that and he and he said he he, he summoned it and the tears came and he was surprised and uh frank capra recorded it all but he unfortunately he did it up from a wide angle shot Oh. But he had, was smart enough not to ask Jimmy to do it again. That was the one take. So what he did was he cut out and zoomed in many times. So from a distance, it's like it's like you you getting me from across the room and then just zooming out. You know, like when you crop a picture, you make the overall image bigger and bigger as you keep taking right. things away. Right. So if you watch, so when you go back and watch it again, you see how masterful uh, Capra and his editing team are that they managed to get this shot that normally, if you had the opportunity, you would set up a camera right here right. to capture the tear coming out of his eye. He's across the room getting something that's supposed to be done inches away from his face. Wow. Things like that just, just absolutely fascinate me. And, and uh, right. it's what well, it keeps me intrigued in this business, even if uh, I'm not a household name yet. Yeah. <laughs> I'm in it because I love it. I, if I got in it for the money, I would have quit long, long, yeah. long ago. Long ago and far away in a Though place you, where food is. You want to know what's so funny? This is what Johnny Depp said when people asked how he became an actor. You know what his story is? He says, I moved to L.A. because I wanted my band to do better. And then, then a friend of mine suggested I do acting because I could make some more money at it. And I'm like, okay, I'll try it. You know, my friend, my friend uh, Nick said, I'll hook you up with my agent. Maybe I can get you on a show. And then, and then Johnny goes, well, yeah, okay. Well, we'll just see what happens. And then, so then 
Johnny gets 21 Jump Street. And he's Ooh. like, because his friend said, that's a good way to make money. And then Johnny's like, and then Johnny goes, you know, then he realized he was making like 2000 bucks a week or something like that. And he's like, I've never made this much money in my life ever. So I'll just keep doing this, even though I don't like it. And I don't like being, you know, and then I don't like being, and then he had already become a teen idol, but he couldn't deal with it. He's like, this isn't who I am. I'm not like this at all. I can't stand all this attention because apparently he's quite an introvert. Mm. And, um, so he was going to quit, but then he decided, you know, I'll just keep doing it because I can need the money and the, the band, it'll help the band. And then finally he realized one day, you know, maybe I am pretty good at acting, so maybe I should start taking some classes. <laughs> and then, of course, he became Johnny wow. Depp. <laughs> now, so, so his story is the opposite of yours. He did it for the money. <laughs> and Later, apparently he decided it, it was an art form of course he still has a band he still tours in his band it's called the like what are they called like the the jump street vampires or they have something vampires is his band I'll, I'll plays guitar. yeah he plays electric guitar and uh do you play guitar i see one behind um, you not much i'm much better at cello and violin and viola than i am at guitar but I have a character who plays that guitar. So it's now, it's much more of a prop than it is an instrument. So I've got yeah. a character named Cowboy Matt. So when Cowboy Matt, we, do you want to see Cowboy Matt real fast? Cowboy Matt, yeah. Okay, so Cowboy Matt, you kind of heard a little bit of him. So he has these glasses and then he's got a cowboy hat. <laughs> okay. Hold on there, folks. We're almost there. Yeah. We need some appropriate cowboy music. Get him, cowboy man. You wanna hear me play it? Play a little tune. Yeah, yeah, cowboy man. What you got What's on that? there? Well, yeah, play us a little bit. A little twangling. How about that, cowboy <laughs> man? Yeah, <laughs> and I don't do no yoga. Yoga. <laughs> What the hell does yogurt have to do with conquest to shirts? <laughs> oh, uh, that's cowboy Matt. Thank you. Service. Thank you. I was going to give you some background music, but I think we'd have to pay for royalties. <laughs> okay, yeah. Well, uh... Okay, now I got to take this off because I, I need to become, I need to go back to Pranakasha Matt. Okay, enough of that. No more cowboy hat. Well, feel free to... Uh... Yeah, so Pranakasha Matt's way cooler than Cowboy Matt. Cowboy Matt is a bit of a fool, but he's got a good heart, but he's confused. So uh, there's, a, there's a video I have called The Internet Shirt Yogi, where Cowboy Matt has a huge role in it. And then we sing the Internet Shirt Yoga song that I sang, Pranakasha Pushtakali Yuchikachit Yoga. Which the funny thing about that is I took um, three quarters of Sanskrit at the UW. And mm -hmm. Sanskrit is the the yoga version of Latin. So like when you do yoga and you're doing like pranayama or, you know, padmasana, all those terms are all Sanskrit terms in yoga. Mm -hmm. So pranakasha pushtakaya yutkajit yoga is internet shirt yoga. 
Pranakasha is the space of life. Pranakasha Pustakalya is the space of light. Libra Pustakalya is library. So I'm calling the internet the space of life library is the internet. And you can do that in Sanskrit. You, they do that a lot. They'll like make a big compound word that means something like that. Because there was obviously there was there was no internet back when Sanskrit was around. So you got to come up with some way to call the internet. So the space of life, like Pranakasha Pustakalya. And of course, Pranakasha is my station. So, or my channel. So that works good. Yeah, Pustakalya. Pustakalya is, is so Pranakasha Pustakalya, space of life library. Utica, Utica is shirt. Jit, when you put jit on the end of it, that means conqueror. So Utica jit means the conqueror of shirts. Yoga, Pranakasa Pustaka Utica jit yoga. It means the yoga of the conquest of internet <laughs> shirts. So it's actually a real term, like a, a, someone who knew Sanskrit and they heard that, they were like, oh yeah. So <laughs> that's what makes it even funnier is that it's actually authentic. And I figured my wife was the one who pointed out that it sounds like uh, supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. And I'm like, <laughs> that's a great idea. Pranakasha wow. Pusakaya, you took a jet when, yoga. Find the shirt Julie, on internet, you conquer it, yoga. Pranakasha Pusakaya, you took a jet yoga. Find the shirt on the internet, you conquer it, yoga. Wow. Once I had Did that, you, then I was Julie rolling. Andrews <laughs> sitting like this in a lotus position. Oh, yeah. The rain in Spain falls mainly <laughs> in the plain. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Interesting. I could see, yeah, we could do some mashups, you know? Oh, we could. So There's so much. Take... Okay. So we got to do it. So actually, we can do any of this stuff. Well, I'm super good at doing green screens. So, like, if you can set up a green screen, we're rolling. I don't know. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to look on Amazon and see if I can get one. Because I'd I like to get one that I get. It sort of it comes down sort of like a curtain. Mm -hmm. Where I can just go right back up like a roll. You know what I mean? I'm going to roll it up and roll it back down when I need me. So I'm going to sit here like this. And I'm going to be like a Boris Becker, you know. Still. Or Arthur Ashe. Or, or, you know. Or, or, or Mike Tyson. Or whatever. You know, just do whatever. Feeling abandoned and wild. Wicked. Fun, we can we can do that. In fact, I know on Amazon or on on eBay, there's a kit that you can buy for ninety nine bucks. It's a green screen, lights, and the whole deal. And and that's uh, little exactly what you described. Oh, wow, perfect! Because All Zoom right. even has a function on here. When I went to take the blur thing off, mm -hmm. I saw that it says there was a little thing. If you have a green screen, you could slide us here. Oh, that was, okay. <laughs> Testicle alert. <laughs> Family show. Mute. Oh, right. Please. <laughs> Look, Please. man, we can't, this is a family show. We can't talk about things that actually create families. No. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Elias, you get that is irony. You get it? Elias. <sighs> More it's one sick. of my favorite lines. I, I invented that, by the way. I invented it in the shower six months ago. Irony? <laughs> no. <laughs> that you Whoa, can't, look what I discovered! That, that you, can't, you can't talk about things. You can't, if it's a family show, you can't talk about things that create families. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Mom, Dad, how did I get here, Billy? Well... Your mother went to Nordstrom's. <laughs> and that was <laughs> it. <laughs> Once I saw her in that red dress. <laughs> I, I went on Amazon. They sent the stork over to the house. We want yeah. a baby boy. She we said, want a would you come into the boy. dressing room and help me put this on? The rest is history. <laughs> yes, yes. Wow. Okay, yeah. now it's now it's forty minutes into when we were supposed to have been wrapping up. <laughs> well, well, you <laughs> have enough material here. You can do parts one, two, and three. 
So yep. if you normally have a 45 minute thing, you've got now three 45 minute sessions. You can but like I said, I usually have a 90 minute show, but I do have one show that was three hours. So we're pushing it. We're two and a half hours, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Math. Oh no, we started slightly late because the, the link supposedly didn't work. Oh, right. But then the moment I sent you a new link, you already were like, Oh wait, I figured it out. You know what it was? <laughs> I realized that what I saved in my calendar, uh, even though it wasn't active, I can, what do you call it? cut and paste. Yeah. So I cut and paste that, lifted it, went into my Zoom application, put it in, and then I went, okay, what is it? Oh, and now I have to go back in because I forgot to get the password. And then I said, well, I can memorize that. Memorized it, typed it in, and I was waiting for you to, to let me in. Do you have to Open remember door, what that 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 magic stream of numbers even now? Uh, five four one four. It was a six digit number. I say, I think it began with a five, like five four one four eight one, something like that. I'm really good Very at memorization. Good. Which why um, I I I I don't like auditions, but if I'm in there in person, I think I'd make a much better impression in person than I do. Uh, Re rever you know, regurgitating stuff that's printed that I have to do over screen. I don't like that. I yeah. love the immediacy of having you right in front of me, sink or swim, you know, rise or fall. But, but so why don't they do? So how come they don't do live Zoom auditions? Do or do they now? Like this. Suppose you set up. Like somebody said, we want you to audition. We want to schedule a Zoom call oh, so we can I work with you one. over Zoom. Somebody did do that. I, I auditioned for um, a job that I didn't get, but it would have it would have been nice because it was at the uh, the uh, downtown Walt Disney, the Walt Disney Concert Hall in downtown Los Angeles, which is designed by Frank Gehry, that really amazing stainless steel building. They did a a, a show, and I auditioned for them, and it was live. I was in my it was in my living room and doing it for the producer and the, and the head of casting who happened to be a friend, which is why I think even got the audition to begin with. And the only reason I didn't get the role was because uh, they liked my accents and they liked my energy, my enthusiasm and my uh, chameleon-like abilities, but I could not hold a note. Oh, no. you need to be able to sing? I am not a singer. I'm a, I'm a stylist. I sing sort of like Bill Murray, Star Wars, give me those Star Wars. You know, kind of goofy, half okay. singing, half like... Fred Schneider of the B-52s, she came from Planet Claire. I know she <laughs> came from that. That kind of shit. You know, that stuff. Okay. Not, but not like... Um, you Can know, you not do like Rock classical. Lobster? Yeah. Rock yeah. Lobster. Yeah. We were at the beach. Ooh, uh, uh, something <laughs> fell in the deep. Someone reached in and grabbed it. Well, the Rock Lobster. <laughs> okay but can you do damn it janet i love you remember that one damn it janet from the rocky horrors picture show oh yeah because I, mean, I did make fun of as in matt what's his name matt weiss <laughs> Okay, I need to see it. So, uh, can you really do a Tim Curry? I'm just a sweet transvestite. Yeah, you need to get someone to Frankenfurter? Frankenfurter. Why don't you come up to the lab and see what's on the slab? <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is. Okay, folks. Okay, we need casting directors to, to pay attention. Notice the wide range that our. The subject has here, Mr. Freeman, mm -hmm. can nah, do a lot America's of whole bunch of different ready. type of stuff. Well, uh, See, I'll you would be perfect well. for egotastic track, but I mean, you'd be stooping low because I mean, the, typically what I do when I do a Zoom call and we shoot a scene, uh, mm -hmm. it's like a one to two hour Zoom call, and I typically give my actors a hundred bucks. So that's the kind of production this is. So I'm sure that's way below your typical fee. So I you're too make good for me. You're you too know? good for my show. But I'd love to see it though. I'd love to, you know, because uh, maybe I could be a creative consultant or I don't know, uh, yeah. 
somebody like that, you know, somebody who can come in and just sort of tweak it a bit, you know. I don't do the comedy. I just make it funnier, you know. Yeah. I don't make the VCR. I just make it perform better, you know. Right. I don't provide the prostitutes. I just make the orgasms more intense. Oh, we can't say that, right? No. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, orgasms produce families, and so that oh, therefore yeah. it can't be on a family show. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine John Houseman coming in? You're making love to your wife. He goes, hold on, sir. What exactly do you think you're doing there? You no, know, no, no, roll over, roll over, son. Let me show you how it's done. Would you mind, Terry? Get these trousers off. You know, first you approach the female of the species with your. <laughs> this is how it's done. See the look of satisfaction on your wife's face? This is the, oh. the look of. What movie was that? That was the Life of Life of Brian. No, what one was that? I just it was a Monty Python. There was a Monty Python movie that did that actual skit. What? I'm trying. Wow. What it was, what, and the funny thing was, okay, here's what the scene was. There was a. They were in a British school, and there's all these kids in the school, and they're like, you know, fifth grade or sixth grade. And the teach it's sex ed, and the teacher's like, okay, we're gonna, we gotta teach you how to do this. So the teacher's, he gets, well, I've got my wife here, and so he's dem he and his wife are having sex, and he's he's and he's demonstrating all the positions, and then then suddenly he goes, hey, you pay attention, all the kids in the, and it's so funny because all the kids in the class are like, they're all bored and they're sleeping and like. You know, so that was the joke, right? Wow. Wow. I wish I, 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 wish I could remember which one it was. I think it was Life of... No, it wasn't Life of Brian. What was the other one? Holy Grail? No, it wasn't uh, Holy Grail. It was much later. Anyways, it was some Monty Python movie. If you look up Monty Python, just Google mm -hmm. something that has to do with a scene like that and it. Well, and I, I think it was have, actually John uh, Cleese. Yeah, John. I'm pretty sure John yeah. Cleese played the schoolmaster hmm. that was sitting well, there. Well, he had a really hot wife back then. He was married to his co-star in uh, the, the woman who played uh, uh, Polly in the show. Yeah, wow. even though, yeah, she was, um, and she's actually American, but she was able, like me, to be a convincing Brit, which is necessary, you know what I mean? Okay, so I need to quiz you on previously when we were talking about green screens and yes. you were boxing and all that. I think you were doing Australian, but it's so easy for Australian to flip into that other brand of British. I forgot what it's called, maybe Cockney or something. Yeah, where it's it's really yeah. hard to distinguish between the two, according to my teacher. Yeah, Cockney is um, a bit more guttural. It's okay. And, you, and there's certain consonants that you don't even pronounce. Like the Americans would say, hi, how are you, right? I would say, hi, how are you? It's almost like I swallowed the H, you know? Ah, or, okay. Yeah, there, there's an H. <laughs> how are you, mate? How are you? Ow, okay. How, how, Yeah. So Harold, Harold, Harold becomes Harold, you know? Harold. Boy, Harold. Oy. No, it's no H here. Yeah. So, and and uh, TH is pronounced with a F. So you say, you think you're funny. You know, I would never say, you think, you think you're funny. You see, think. <laughs> Thank you. Got, yeah, so it's all, it's all, it's all like that. Right? I kind of, I like, um, there's two uh, Cockney accents that I really like. Well, three. I like uh, Terrence Stamp. Um, he did a movie called The Limey. You really got to see that one. Um, I like Bob Hoskins in uh, Mona Lisa. And um, what was that third one? Really, really good one. There's a bloody gravelly grown man. I think it's one of those. Um, who was that bloke that was uh, shagging up, that American actress, um, Madonna? Guy Ritchie, yeah, him, that bloke. All of his movies, like Snatch, Cunt, all of them. They're really good, you know? They really, really get to the. the the, the basics of what I'm trying to say. But if you yeah. want to go up, I say Roger Moore, but, you know, can't talk like this, you see. Roger Moore's a more sophisticated music. I remember him from The Saint. See, and this is, we got to do a show like this because, like, your accents are so good that when a person sees you in a movie, they just think that's your real voice. That's right? why when I audition, 
but like if we did a show where you flipping between all the ones and you're showing that that you're doing it then it then it's so much more amazing now because they're like oh dude this guy can do all these different characters just like that that's why i want to do animation because i don't want people to see my face you can if you can hire me and i can do 10 voices on one television show that's nine other actors that are out of work but that's more money for me you see i gotta buy Mm -hmm. dog food you know what i mean yeah you do need to buy some dog i gotta buy razor blades okay you know and you go, hey, I got a sparkly personality. Why don't you give me a shave? He's like, get out of here. <laughs> well, at least you don't You're have sparkly. cats, so you don't have to buy cat litter. No, no, no. I, well, I had an ex girlfriend whose who's dad, her stepdad, was really a clever fellow. He, 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 not professionally, he does this, but for a favor, he will teach your cat how to um, take care of its business. I was at her house. The first time I met her family, we both were from New York, right? So we go to meet my family. <laughs> and then we go to meet her family in Tarrytown, right? Sitting around the table. Her, her mum, stepdad, me, having a nice meal. I think Vivaldi was playing in the background, four seasons. Hey, little pussycat comes running. Hey, a nice little pussycat. Oh, who's going to go to the bathroom? I said, he's going to the bathroom. I said, oh, okay. So I go, and I hear the cat go into the bathroom. I hear the door squeak open. And then all of a sudden, I'm waiting for the scratch of the litter box, and I hear the toilet flush. <laughs> what the fuck? And I said, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to scream, like, you know, but did your cat just flush the toilet? And then they all look, yeah, and I thought they were putting me on, right? So I go in and I look, and you see the cat looking at me like, yeah. <laughs> it was sitting on top of the glue. And he has this process where he, he gets a clear, it's almost like a like clear plastic okay. lid. And it fits on top of the toilet. You put the lid up, but you get the second lid down, and you put a little bit of the gravel there, kitty litter. And so you, you indoctrinate the cat to going up there, instead of sinks his litter box. So it eventually starts pawing, and then and it, it poops on that. And then eventually, you t- use less and less litter, and then you, one day you just take the lid away, and the cat just goes up there and just squats over the opening and just goes. But the but but that's that's an amazing in and of itself. But to have it know how to take its hand and push the lever and flush. I was like, that is fucking gold. I would love to have somebody at my house, you know, we're eating. I was like, well, somebody brush my leg. That's my cat. Don't worry about it. Oh, well, it's cat. Oh, it's, it's just going to use the bathroom. Don't mind it. You know, and make sure I turn the music down so you can hear uh, the clinking of forks. A cat just walking down the hall and you hear the door open and then you hear the <laughs> it just makes you like I, I, I like creating little moments like that, you know? That's great. Cat. So her cat, is, but I, we broke up before I could get a cat to be talked about. Oh, by darn it. <clears throat> yeah. You said something wrong, and that was it. That's right, ladies. Yesterday. Can you believe it? All my troubles oh, seem so far away. I was now actually thinking more of Bill, <laughs> uh, uh, Bob Marley. No woman, no cry. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. No woman. Don't cry. <laughs> hey, darling, don't shed no tear. <laughs> One selection, chuck a chuck me, turn the white, the black, and all the people that want to me see. Go on. You don't know what you're talking about, man. Matt Queen interviewing Mr. Freeman. And all you're getting is a, a cheap second rate of Robin Williams, eh? Robin Williams on a note on Percocet. I don't know. Right. What do you think? Well, we get what we get. That's just the way it is, you know? Yeah. Mr. Freeman, well, like we get inside Mr. Freeman's head and then the, it's like a chaos in there. There's like things flying around. It's like, you know, like a juggling act. You know, there's dogs, there's ponies, there's like a pinata and there's kids like they hit it and all this candy's like everywhere, you know? But that's just the way it is. Say hi to Matt. Hey there, Say hi to Matt. doggy. <laughs> yeah. Hey, you, you're a cute mutt, you are. Yeah. <laughs> Who's your daddy? <laughs> she was like, okay, wrap it up, or I'm going to drop another deuce. All right, so, then. Take her out. So, like, but, uh, so let's, I'm going to put links to your um, IMDb page, of course. Yeah, and yeah, then, yeah, yeah. Then what I do is I put, like, pictures of of you above us. 
there'll be a kind of a strip of like maybe four or five pictures that just kind of represent your your work. I usually just take it from uh, the internet. Uh, I like uh, Google cool. Nathaniel Freeman and then stick them there. Did you and fart? Then, uh, okay. Well, okay. Um, I sorry. don't have any incense. That's one thing okay. I need in this room is incense. We got the lava Great. lamp. Anyhow. If you need it, I can send you some. I mean, I have right. you from space. Well, send me like and your I bio. If, it, if there's a good, if you have a good bio that I can copy and paste and throw in the, the description, that's all good. And then mm -hmm. all your links, like I know you abandoned Facebook. Yes. Yes. Instagram. Instagram. And, and you I don't tweet. I, no. So um, I, I make, I, I do have a friend who's trying to get me to uh, start a YouTube channel. She thinks she's a 20 something. So I don't know what generation that is, but she thinks that I'm very talented. She's an actress. She's in Norway. Well, there and, you go. Um, she wants me to, she wants to help me st start a, a, a YouTube channel. But well, I think she's in, met a new boy now. And so they're doing so their Romeo and Juliet. So I, I, I may be on the back burner is what I'm trying to say. But, yeah. You know. Hits. Well, what are you gonna? Well, whatever you know. Well, oh, do you, well. <clears throat> I forgot to mention Brian McClure. One of his side hustles, of course, folks. It, the way it is in the industry, even if you're actually quite successful of an actor, like for example, Brian has been on tons of shows, just like e Ethan. Yes. Lots of yes. TV shows. He gets calls for auditions all the time. Mm -hmm. And when he's doing the show, he gets paid well. But in between, you know, if you're not doing a show that week, you're not getting paid. So it's most actors have some kind of side gig, too, to fill in the gaps. So one of the things that Brian does, uh, he says he's a graphic designer. And then he also helps people put together reels. So, like, like if you need a up-to-date actor's reel, uh, talk to him and he can help you do it. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Yes, you know, I I'm think still that not would be my a Kamikaze jacket. Damn it! All right, hold on. Cowboy Matt just totally effed up everything. This sec. Kamikaze, Kamikaze. Ah! And now for you. I knew something was wrong. It's just the energy wasn't right. And now I suddenly realized how many, how long has it been going on? I'm pretending to be Pranakasha Matt and I'm not even wearing my uniform. Uh, <sighs> like okay, I now like. we're back. So like All I right. said, I mean, like I'm a seasoned YouTuber, as you can tell. So I, I can tell you all how to do all that stuff. Yeah. So, so talk you, to my friend Brian McClure, and I, uh, I might even maybe I might text him from my cell phone for you. Well, <laughs> considering it's after midnight over there, <laughs> I'll probably reach out to him over the weekend, maybe. Oh, do you or, have Brian's number as well? Absolutely. Would like just oh. do wanted me to come live with him. You think I would not have his phone number? <laughs> well, I mean, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, I get his, I guess, the entire cast. And not from the call sheet. I actually know these people. I know these people. These are my people, my family. All right, touche, you out name dropped me. Yeah. You, 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 you got me. I only was able to name drop Brian and Ethan, but you got to name drop the whole cast. So that well, I'll I give know. you several points. <laughs> Thank you. And, oh, and Armin Shimmerman, yeah, I was in his home. Of course, he wasn't there, but. There were pictures of him in the house. I knew what he, I knew what he looks like. So I you got to him. inspect his medicine cabinet? You know what's funny? I had an apartment <laughs> where I, I put a sign inside my medicine cabinet. As soon as he opened the door, it said, bust it. Now, what are you doing sleeping in there? Close it and go back to what you were doing. And don't forget the flush. And when people <laughs> used my bathroom, they would come out laughing. And as soon as they laughed, I said, you nosy mother. <laughs> I know what you did, man. You were in my medicine cabinet. How'd you? I heard you laughing. There's nothing funny in my bathroom unless you, you're you being nosy. That's yeah. clever. Yeah. Very clever. Okay, we, I, we are wrapping up. We are on the, we're almost to the cusp of the wrap up session. 
We're 59 minutes into wrapping up. <laughs> <laughs> Again. Yes. It was a long haul, but it was worth it. Okay. Hold wow. On. I, I almost tipped over this whole thing, and that wouldn't have been good. Because this thing is like on a cardboard box. It's like always oh, no. teetering on disaster. Because it well, needed to be four inches higher to show in the in the screen. Story of my life. Yeah. Teetering on the edge. I wish I had four more inches. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Tell me about it. <laughs> yeah. But as far as I'm concerned, eight is enough. But yeah. <laughs> ah, look at this guy pulling yeah. on me. Van Patten. <laughs> <laughs> what a dick, Van Patten. <laughs> Don't be a dick. Where's the sign that says don't be a dick? It's time for that to come out. No racism at any time. Don't be a dick. A-holes, this means you. Yeah. You know who you are. If you have to ask, you probably are. So look to your left. Yeah. Look to your right. Wow. <sighs> well, how would okay. you know if this is a successful broadcast? Do people like give you feedback on each episode? How will I know? Ooh. Uh, yeah, I'll know. Uh, the most successful yeah. is if I'm getting like a, a comment stream a mile long where there's flame wars and people arguing, you know, uh, and spewing hate. That's a successful video, big time. And then, God, of so course, nice guy and like then me, YouTube will be... share it all over. No. Wow. I mean, it'll show me how many views it gets and how many likes. And, um, but typically, my my uh, interviews will typically get between two thousand and three thousand views on my channel. So Whoa, yeah, that. it oh, takes oh, a while oh, to build oh, up that yeah. many, but yeah. yeah. And then uh, I, for me, I like the weird thing about my channel is that um, I get a lot of likes and views, but I don't really get a whole lot of comments. I mean, I get some, but not nearly as many as I'd like. So people are a little so, shy on my channel for some reason. I haven't figured it out why yet. Or but, everything that's being said is nothing that they feel worthy of commenting. That's really that's pretty amazing. When you think about how people comment on the most mundane of things, you could have a a puppy licking a baby, and somebody will write, "That's disgusting." I would let my dog's tongue touch a baby's face, and, and there's gonna be a flame war over that. You know, yeah. a boy scout could be helping an old lady across the street. Is like, did she ask for his help? Maybe she doesn't want. Maybe he's embarrassing her. You know? Oh my gosh! I know. Can't you do something nice without somebody turning it into something else. Wow. Well, then if you go over to my other channel, which doesn't really have many subscribers, I think it has like five hundred. Compared to here, I have like 14,000, but my other channel flipped the switch. I've got some videos over there that are really controversial, you know, and pisses people off. So then I get lots of comments, you know? So, uh, is that the one where you take your, your hood, your, your KKKK hood off, and you think it's like, we're interviewing the fan, kill the hood, kill the hood, kill the hood. You know, kill, it's like you come in. Yeah. All yeah. right. We got it. Okay. We got to do something. Somehow we got to hook up again. And do some kind of thing. I, well, we should probably do. I really do want to do some Shakespeare, though. But I mean, that's a Manolo. different deal. But just some scenes. I wanted to do like short scenes of Shakespeare. You know, um, you might be able to have the teddy bear. How about that cello? That mm, we're talking. No. A D. I love that cello. Yeah, and I, I love it too. However. <laughs> I can direct you to the violin maker and cello maker who sells them oh, I and can like get that, you a please. similar one for a similar yes. price. Of course, I would get a 10% commission, but that, that's <laughs> immaterial. Uh -huh. uh, what else uh, yeah, have we got I, here? It um, would actually work. I could, I could part with this frog. Let's see, let's see if you like the, the tone quality. Uh, would you like a a frog a wooden frog? That would be a good prize. Uh, I or actually if you don't like I the tone of that. I've got the smaller one. Uh, that reminds me of a group called Deep Forest. They're a pygmy tribe. I think they're in South America, and some French dude went there years ago and recorded the sounds into this amazing CD. Okay. I got, I'll see if I can send you something. It's called Deep Forest. Deep, Deep Forest. Deep Forest, that sounds... Are there didgeridoos in it? 
Uh, I, I should hope. I don't think so. I go, no, that, that would be Australia. It's a different different continent. That's These all South America. I think flutes, flutes, and chimes and dings, and mostly their voices, ants. But I think I think you'd like it. Did you say yeah. ants? Chants. 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 Okay, I, that's better. A uh, chants. A chants. I'm chants. Well, now that you messed me up, because chants could be either chants or chants. So which is it? My favorite film. One of my favorite films, Being There. Oh, Being There. That's Peter, such a great movie. Peter Sellers' last film. Yes. Chauncey the Gardener. What did I tell you as a white man's America? That boy is dumb as a pissant. Look at me and talking to the president. <laughs> Only in America, the white, 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 white. I was like, I hear you, sister. Preach. Preach. Hallelujah. Oh, okay. That was so good. Okay, now we're approaching the three hour mark. Three, oh. two, one. Cheeseburger, no Coke, Pepsi, no Coke, Pepsi. Oh, wow. John Belushi's Greek Tagu. diner meets. Siam. <laughs> okay. Yes. Oh, wow. Tagu. Cheeseburger, Siam. Omar. Oh, wow. Tagu. Siam. <laughs> what movie is that from? Oh, wow. I remember that. Tagu. <laughs> You can just sing it over to me. <laughs> oh, you, you know, I'm talking to you and I'm creating a list of movies I got to re-see again. I'm going to put that on my list. Okay. Um, North Dallas 40 with Nick Nolte, who plays a football player on the team. Oh, shit. Matt the Davis. Orville just crashed. No. Or the Whoa. Orville box. Thank goodness the Orville didn't. The Orville box crashed right when I... Communicator. Wow. Nothing's happening. I have one to beam up. Out of here. No intelligent life down here. One to beam up. Get me out of Nathaniel here. Daniel Freeman. Oh, that was, no wonder, you know what? That was the crappy one. This is way better. This can be, This is smaller, but it's way better. This one has more stuff in it. Actual voice. Bridges is wow. the captain. I wonder how much money captain, he gets. Come in, captain. That was a horror. We can't make transporter contact, sir. Your signal is very weak. Can you turn up your game? That was that was Spock. Captain, shall I beam down an arm party? Oh yeah. yeah. I got so many okay. props on this table, and. And I did. We didn't even scratch the surface of all the props on this table yet. And what fell down? Yeah, oh, no, my, my so tattoo phaser. That's not good. Okay, so okay, that's back. But my Air Force Chevron is down there, and I can't. We it, there would be too much dead air if I were to climb under there to find it. None less. And we can't have dead air unless Mister Freeman can somehow like fill it in a bit. Think you can I'm handle that, kitty? Kiddo. Man. I've been everywhere. <laughs> Stretch across the desert bear. I've been everywhere. I've been a green, no free, no chicks, no ticks, no ticks, all chick us all, wick talk. Denver, Denver, Cleveland, Salt Lake City. Uh, where else have I been? San Diego, Montreal, uh, Tampa, Torco, Fanta, uh, uh, shit, Estonia. I've been everywhere, man. Toronto, Montreal, man. Yes. I've been everywhere. Have you been to Frankenmuth, Michigan? Philly. I bet you haven't been to Frankenmuth, Michigan. No. The closest I've been to Michigan is probably Minnesota. I've been to Lake Minnetonka. I went to Super Bowl XXIVX, whatever, whatever, 2016. I was in the, the coldest Super Bowl ever. Mm. Throws my... Beep, beep, off, but uh, had fun. Had fun. Yeah. I like cold places. I've been to, I've been to Finland. That's cold. I've been Ooh, to Iceland, cold. Uh, Estonia. Yeah, I arrived Estonia. at 9.30 in the morning 
and it was as dark as it is outside now. I was freaking out. I didn't realize before going that I'd been that that was flying so hot, climb high to the Arctic Circle. So I'm I have a one serious a question right now. Yeah. This isn't a Heil Hitler. This is a, I have a question, but if I did it like that, it would go above the screen. But have you ever seen the Northern Lights? Not in person, but I'm going to correct that mistake soon. I, did, I told you my aforementioned Norwegian friend has invited me to come over there, and my Finnish friends would like me to return. So I think I'm going to do a Scandinavian tour in my future. I see Ooh. a return to Finland, uh, a return to Sweden and uh, my first trip to Norway and hopefully Iceland. I don't know if I'm going to do Denmark, but I'm going to get four, three out of five, maybe four out of wow. five Scandinavian. Yeah. Cool. Because that's one of my life goals, too, is to see it in real life. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh-oh. Dry throat. Oh, no, I'm out of kombucha. Now now we're just, now the show's really got to be over. I thought you're gonna. I think it's time for a product placement. That's when your your sponsors come in. Uh, <coughs> that's when I reach for Fisherman's Friend. <laughs> oh, I do have fish. I know exactly what Fisherman's Friend is, I, and I have it right next to my bed. So I'm, to pr to protect my wife from morning breath, I take a Fisherman's Friend at night. Um, now that's a conscientious guy, yeah. Uh, my well, it me. took me like 15 years to come up with that. <laughs> Better late than never. I'm still got dragon breath and I'm single. <laughs> <laughs> rim shot. If I had Let's a see, fisherman's I have friend, a rim shot? I'd have a friend next to me. That's about as close to a rim shot as I can do. <laughs> uh oh. Okay. I can do, I'll do that. <laughs> <laughs> wow that was that was really good would you like another hit at that cigar yes by all means uh <clears throat> okay we're finally wrapping up we're wrapping up we're past the three hour mark we gotta stop otherwise youtube is gonna cut me off they're gonna ban oh. my channel for posting videos that are too long but okay that's, that's the part two circling back to up. star trek um yeah <laughs> So, Mr. Spock, right, is, um, wouldn't you say that Mr. Spock was, was sort of represented, I mean, he was the outcast, so, and he was, so he, um, even though when you watch it, you th at least when I was a kid, you still thought of Spock as a white guy, but really, he was a, a, totally another race, you know, yeah. totally out of his element. And people were making mm -hmm. fun of him all the time, but he was he had enough integrity and and enough belief in who he was that it never really phased him. It just just fell off, you know, like little raindrops. It's like if Sidney Poitier had pointed ears and was on the Star Trek. Yeah. You know, the epitome or Jackie Robinson, any black man of accomplished who's accomplished and uh and misunderstood, but took the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune and racism and managed to eke out a living and lead by example and not be angry and bitter. I have to take my hat off to him. And it's just, cause that's, I mean, we, we have, I mean, I'm not taking anything away from the, the, the soldiers and the Fred Hamptons and the Malcolm X's and all, but some of the, sometimes a soldier just being able to be able to, to be the shield, not necessarily the, the sword being able to, to take the slings and arrows of outrageous racism and uh, mm -hmm. and come back for more, you know, or or not let it mess with you, you know. If I I could be a much different person, a much darker person, if I allowed the ugliness that America has shown me and places mm -hmm. like it um, uh, to to manifest in my day to day um, life. But I I realize that although uh, things have been done to uh, my people people of color everywhere mm -hmm. the world over you aren't necessarily the enemy because you are the color of the enemy you know it's it's right. it's it's a system we're fighting so it was once said i forget where i heard this but if you took a hundred black ants and a hundred red ants and placed them in a jar they would coexist just fine really take that same jar and you shake it they start fighting each other to the death 
all the while not knowing that their real enemy is the person who shook the jar. So yeah. before you sit there and you look at somebody that's a different race or different uh, sexual orientation or different religion or no religion and, you know, decide that person's the enemy and you're not, ask yourself who's shaking the jar. Who's putting me at odds against you and you against me? Who's the, the man enemy? pulling the yeah. strings? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So when I tell you that I don't like police brutality, don't come back and tell me that I hate. I, I said this to somebody in a conversation. I hate police brutality. And this white woman turned back and said to me, really? So how long have you hated cops? Okay. Said, Excuse me. Is, is that what I said to you? Okay. No, that's what you chose to hear. In the interest of wrapping up, I need to respond to this, okay? So, yeah. of course, the stupidest thing ever, in my opinion, okay, we have, there is police brutality, right? Yes. There is. It exists, and we need to do something about it. And also, there's racial profiling, right? Yes. We need to do something about it. But then the stupidest ass thing that people came up with was defund the police. <laughs> like, that's really yeah. going to work. And then next week, they're terrible. like, oh, no, um, there's people stealing from my car. There's people, oh, no, I defunded the police. Darn it. I didn't think that I actually needed the police. <laughs> I, I think rather than defund, I think <laughs> uh, maybe it's, maybe it just it fits because it's such a smaller word. But I would rather say reallocate the funds to the police. So rather than spend an inordinate amount of money on riot gear and armored tanks to cruise right. down the street in middle America, why don't you take that same money and put it towards educating? I've lived in Europe. I've mm -hmm. lived in Canada. And I've lived in countries where, the, where the, the, the police actually become police after years of training. Right. You That's the problem. These people as those people and not people in general, you're not going to police them with compassion, with empathy. Right. But if my policeman is the same guy that lives two blocks over from me and I know his wife and his kids and they go to the same school as my kids, he's going to see my kids. He's going to see the humanity in the kids. He's, he, and he might not take a kid who stole a bike and take him off to jail or beat him senseless because he knows right. kids are going to do stupid kid things. But a right. white cop from Long Island coming to police an area in the Bronx sees us. I'm just, I'm just here to get my eight hours in, keep these savages at bay so I can go back to my white wife, my white family, my white friends on Suffolk County. You know? Yeah. Come on. Come on. Yeah. I, I, was, I mean, I think the most successful, of course, I'm no expert, but it seems like the most successful campaigns are like exactly what you said, where the, the police become diplomats and they go, they, they become part of their beat, right? They go out and make friends and everybody, they develop a rapport and, you know, there are real, people see them as a real person yeah. and they see the people on their beat as a real person and then it's successful. But the it's, beat cops are gone now. You don't see beat cops, you know? They're all in cars or, or paddy wagons or in riot gear, ready to like break up any groups of three or larger. <laughs> I, I just, yeah. Uh, well, they don't even yeah, get don't partners be... anymore. Like they have to drive around alone, too. Oh, so well, they do have a partner. They have an unwilling partner that they don't want. It's called their body cam. Yeah. Yes. Officer, yeah. what exactly did I do wrong? Oh, what did you do wrong? I'll tell you. Yeah. <laughs> As he turns his body camera off. Okay. Yeah. Now we can have a more frank discussion. <laughs> yeah. We have this going internet. Yeah. It's, I mean, obviously it's a really huge issue that's been going on forever. <clears throat> yeah. And, and so for someone that's white to tell them, anyone Brown, don't bring up the race card. Stop playing the race card. Don't ever say that expression to me. That's one of two things I don't want to hear white people tell me. I don't, don't play the race card, card, dude. Don't play the race card, yes. Yeah. Uh, because everything is about race. That's how this country was started. Race. Mm. Race. Okay? You got rid of one race, and you brought in another race, and subjugated them to 400 years, 16 to 19. Okay? Right. Come on. Come on. It's, it's everything's about race. Re redlining neighborhoods, you know, uh, I just, it, it, we, it's a long discussion. We don't have time for We're already over. Yeah, the well, what's the, I mean, the thing is, it seems like the, actually, it's a really good discussion to have. 
especially yeah, since is. I'm a white guy and you're a black guy and we can actually talk frankly about it because we're now we're buddies. So yeah. we yeah. might as well get into it. You know, we, we can have you, you'll really win the prize. I'll have to send you both frogs because we might end up hitting a four hour video, four hour interview. <laughs> Back, we're getting close. Um, so, I mean, we might as well talk about it because it's obviously an important thing to talk yeah. about. Yeah, but I, I could go on for hours and, and I think if it's a touchy subject in well, America. Yeah. Thing is, think, but I, the I, thing is, we got to have this discussion. Yeah, we like, do. Otherwise, we'll, just everybody is just going to stay in their own little silos forever. But right? If, I guess if I thought it would do any good, but I think people, when they hear things they don't like, that, that with cognitive dissonance, they okay. just turn off. They tune but, out. But if you refuse to even, well, you just shut your own self down. You know why? Because every time I brought this up, uh -huh. uh, I've been shut. I've been shut down, and you. And nine, nine times out of ten, the person that shut me down is not a black or brown person. I could talk for race for three or four hours to somebody else that's brown, whether they agree or have the same experience as me. Doesn't right. matter. They can listen with a discerning ear. But what yeah, happens? Yeah, but then when you're kind of preaching happens, to the choir, right? But when you speak to someone who's not of the same race, okay. they either have one of two reactions. Most, I'm sure there's a myriad of emotions people can experience, but the two predominant ones that I get, okay. I, I encounter, are they get extremely defensive and they start talking in terms of like, I didn't do that, I, my family don't own slaves. I'm like, no one's accusing you. I'm simply talking about what the white man has done and is still doing. If it applies, then it applies. If it doesn't, you can still have this conversation with me. I'm right. sure a black person has angered you in your life. You don't look at me as if I'm that same person, right? So, True. Or <clears throat> they don't get defensive. Um, they start trying to minimize what I'm going through. Like they'll say, I, I, I've got a friend who's from Ireland, and he'll say, well, but you know, Nathaniel, the, the Irish were slaves too, you know. Yeah. Yeah, they may have been. Just like they were slaves in Egypt, they were slaves in a lot of places in the world. But right. American slavery is a beast of its of its of its own kind. There's nothing okay. else like it. Right. We set they set <laughs> the table for how it's done everywhere else now. Interesting. <laughs> in okay. Africa, when there were black tribes that were made that made slaves of other warring nations, they actually had an agreement. You would work a certain time, you were paid, and then you were freed of your obligation. That's a far cry from the kind of slavery that existed here. Right. But when you put it in one big lump, lump, lump it all into one big category, you, you minimize what's been done to people that you no, know nothing about. <laughs> hmm. Okay, you know, you brought up a big, a really interesting point that I never thought of before was how come, like, why didn't, the slave owners have make slaves out of Native Americans. They tried, and okay. it didn't work. They found that um, there were two things that were happening as they, as they kept trying to indoctrinate the, Native, the indigenous people. I don't call them Native Americans, but... Oh, okay, indigenous, um, okay. Uh, one, they would kill themselves rather than be slaves. Okay. And the, those that did not kill themselves simply could not handle the workload and were just dying in droves. They found the African to be of more, in, more. The body was more acclimated to that kind of brutality. It hmm. could take it. Interesting, because I mean, I know like the tribe, different tribes would have get in wars, and they would take slaves of each other. Yeah. So maybe they it took wasn't white people as slaves. You know, they right. made them serfs. But when it didn't work with the whites. When it didn't work with the indigenous people, they said, they were, well, we, we're on to something. You just got to fight. I know. Let's go to Africa. We can continue to rape and rob that continent blind for thousands of years. There's mm -hmm. still people dying over there now for the cobalt that's in, what was that country? All of, because now the, everything we have, the, the tablets, the computers, the watches, they all need this, this one um, ingredient. Cobalt, um, yeah. I think it yeah. might be South Africa. <clears throat> uh, there was a Congo? Or was it Congo, maybe, yeah. yeah but, but, it, but the people are dying in droves over there. And like, yeah, because the kids, it's like child labor. 
Yeah. Yeah. They, 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 they've carved up Africa and they've um, and they're still carving it up and they're just ripping it. You know what? Everyone tells us to go back to Africa. I would love to do exactly what, what Marcus Garvey tried to do. But I would go. I would have us all go back to Africa with one proviso. Get the whites out. The De Beers Corporation. Diamonds, yeah. South Africa. De Beers. Uh, I, I, correct me if I'm wrong. Is that Dutch? Get them out. Turn it yeah. over to the blacks and get out. Okay, we everybody else can go back to their countries of origin, and they have a place they can call home. The Japanese can go home, the Canadians can go home, the Mexicans can go home. You know, yeah. and, and 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 they go a place where they own it. They're people that look like they own everything. You go to Africa, and it's all owned by all these colonizers from mm -hmm. Europe. In other countries that still have carved have carved up their place and still have the people there living poor in squalor and large sections of the continent don't have the internet don't have Wi-Fi. Well, it's interesting. Like, I wonder if is that the case in Liberia too? I'd have to get back to you. Huh, because, that. like, I, I mean, I've I've gotten to know several people in Liberia now, and and we've done Zoom calls and stuff. And to this date, I haven't seen a single white person. Everybody is black, but there's all kinds of different levels. I mean, there's rich people, poor people, and the government doesn't seem to care one iota about um, the poor people. And um, But like in that scene, and I haven't heard from anybody saying that it's white people are oppressing them. It's just basically the rich and the government just basically is oppressing them and so there it's not a racial issue it's purely economic mm. that's why i made that that's why i made that comment early on where i said well like i've i've gotten to know some people in africa and and the african africans are nothing like the united states africans except the their skin's the same color but other than that they're it's a completely different culture Absolutely. Well, I, I, I know that firsthand, too, because uh, one of my best friends is from the Gambia, and I met okay. him back in the night. Um, I have uh, a few friends from uh, Eritrea and, and Nigeria. I did a, pl a play uh, in many years ago in New York, and the director was a uh, Nigerian. I did a, a retelling of Rope, uh, Alfred Hitchcock's famous film. Mm -hmm. uh, and... Uh, I had to lead role in that. He was Nigerian. I, I, I say that to say that if you grow up black outside of America, you're definitely going to have a different worldview than mm -hmm. someone that was raised here. Right. And that's one of the reasons, one of the many reasons why I do the, the volunteer work with the children that I do, mm -hmm. because I realized of all the things that can be given and taken away from me, mm -hmm. even my freedom, the one thing that can't be taken away from me is my intellect. Right. I mean, was, okay. Here's another question for you. Yeah. Um, so it seems like, uh, in, in a sense, blacks in America are like, are kind of a unique situation. Like, what's it like in the UK? What, how are blacks treated in the UK? I have two black friends that are in the UK. Well, actually, one is now married to a German woman and lives in Berlin. The other is living in. Yeah, no, she, she, she's in. In fact, I'm going to visit her for the first time. We met online, um, so I, I, I guess I can't answer that question until I've, I've had a conversation with them. Because the, everyone else I know in the UK is, is either white or, or, or Indian descent. Um, right. Okay. So, so I, okay, here's another Indian. weird one for you. So suppose what would happen if you're um, well, even in LA, suppose like you get stopped for a traffic cop, traffic violation or supposed violation by a white LAPD. Like what would happen if when he talks to you, you suddenly went, talk to him in like a British accent. What do you think he would do? Oh, I've done that. How does that well, work? Not, not, with a, not with a cop, but, um, uh, it's a really funny story, and I think I'm going to make it into a movie or a play or something. Um, so I don't want to give you too much information. But many years ago in New York, I was a struggling actor, couldn't get work as an actor, not even as a regular human being. I just couldn't get work. Mm -hmm. I got tired 
of having doors slammed in my face. So I decided to do something clever and reinvent myself. Okay. And I remembered how I used to love the uh, the mods and 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 the the look of the guys in the '60s in 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 the United States and England with the shark skin suits mm -hmm. and the, you know, almost like the Temptations if they were if they were in in uh, a Carnaby Street. But I, uh, I I I dressed as a proper English gentleman, complete with a walking stick. Okay. And I don't know if I had the bowler hat. I don't remember. But I went and I applied for work at uh, Bloomingdale's, New York City department store. Okay. And uh, I walked into the human resources department looking for a job. And I walked in and said, hey, good morning. I'm, my name's Nathaniel Freeman. I'm looking for work. Uh, I, I'm seeking employment. And I, I would want to know, is, are you hiring at the moment? And uh, when I said that, um, I was talking to a woman, a caramel colored woman sitting at the desk and behind her were about 10 to 12 people sitting at individual desks, filling out applications, all their heads lifted when they heard the words coming out of my mouth. I couldn't understand why they would all look up in unison. I'm sure that they'd heard an English accent before. What unbeknownst to me was that the woman I was sort of speaking to when I said that, so she looked just right, uh, crikey, so uh, do, do you have your CV? You got a biro, and she, she was English as well. So they were like, so they, everyone was like, oh my God, this is going to be good. And, I was, and that's when I began to shit my pants because I realized, <laughs> oh my God, I'm faking it. She's a real deal, and she's going to sort me out in two seconds, right? Well, <laughs> you asked me if I got a CV. I know what a CV is, right? So I put out the CV, bring it, curriculum vitae, right? Resume. I got a biro, slide for pen. So I got to so say, yeah, she, she has me clipboards. I said, have a seat over there, Governor. We'll call you in a minute. I said, great. Cheers. I sit down. No harm, no foul, right? Great. I plop down to the first empty desk I can find, and I'm sitting right next to a blonde, blue-eyed woman who's from Australia. She goes, hey, go, mate. It's so good to see you. We've got to stick together, you and I. You know? So go, <laughs> shit. <laughs> I'm still in the Long story short, <laughs> I had to continue to be an English person. I got hired, so I had to stay as an English person the entire time I was working there. And uh, yeah, there's some funny stories. There was one time where a few of my mates from Harlem came into the store and they saw uh -oh. me there like, hey, yo, Matt, what's up, baby? How you doing, man? That's my boy, <laughs> man. And I'm like, and I'm, and I'm dealing with these little old white ladies. I'm giving them samples of beef to tongue liver and slicing up pieces of cheese. I'm like, oh, do you like do you like a stilton? Yes, yes. At the one moment, darling, I'll be right with you. I think I'm like, what the fuck y'all want, man? Come on, man. You see, I'm at my job. Hey, boy, I'll be right back. <laughs> so, yeah, so, like, so, like, so, so would, you like, would you like some more stilton? Would you like to try this thing? And my difficulty was keeping my American friends away from the English people, the people who thought I was English. Because if they saw me together, one of them's going to say, "Hey, what's up?" You know. But um, so it, it, it's a it's a much longer story than okay. That, so than this that. I mean, this is a perfect formula for a, a comedy, right? Yeah, yeah. I, guess, you I know, mean, there's been a lot of shows that that have done that where you have to. I mean, that's like Mrs. Doubtfire going back to Robin Williams, right? Yeah. You know, he had to play two different things, and the thing is, you can do it. You're so good at it. You could do. You can pull it off. I got a girlfriend as a result of this. And I can tell you, it's a much longer story. That woman that I sat next to, eventually we became friends, we exchanged numbers and all that, right? So now, six, fast forward to six, seven months later, it's summer of the next year, and uh, I'm with my mate, and we're going down Columbus Avenue, and uh, it's hot, summer, fucking bored. And my phone rings, and it's Melissa, right? She's like, hey, Melissa. Oh, what are you on? What are you up to? I was like, oh, I'm with my, I'm with my mate here. We're, just, we're in Central Park. It's like, well, why don't you come over? And hang out, you can meet my sister and my roommate. It's like, where? I realize a woman's calling me and she's got at least two other women there. And me and my single friend have nothing to do. We'll be right over. <laughs> so <laughs> we go get beer and pizza. And uh, I tell them, I say, hey, look, I know it's going to sound weird to you, but just go with it. They think I'm English. It's a long fucking story. I don't have time to go into it now. <laughs> Just back me up with whatever I say, okay? He goes, okay, okay, fine, fine. As long as I get the drink and and and, and, and eat pizza. So we get a, a pizza pie and, a, and a, I think a six pack of Foster's or something. We go up to the house and I walk in and five beautiful women, Melissa, her twin sister, also Australian, her American roommate, who eventually becomes my girlfriend, and two other women that were visiting. Five women, two guys. I like those odds. 
And, um, <laughs> and of course, they all fell in love with my accent. I'm talking like this, so they're like liking it. So that's really fun. <laughs> and I found it really amazing that even when I was talking to people that I've never met before, but were am black Americans, when you sound like this, all of a sudden, you're like, you're instantly light. You, you seem different and they're intrigued by you. And, the, and so the same person dressed the same way, but talking like this, I, I couldn't get two nickels rubbed together. Get the fuck out of my way, man. I, 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 move, move, nigga, move. But speaking like this, all of a sudden, and I, now I'm speaking generalities. Of course, there's always going to be someone that doesn't like it, no matter what. Get your right. army ass out of here. About it. In general, moreover than not, seven out of ten people are like fascinated. Black, white, gay, straight. They're like, yeah. Yeah, well, you really, I, 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 I just, I, you could just recite the alphabet. You could just talk. So what about like, anything? Just, just talk. I, I, just, I just like the accent. So it's like, I realized, wow, I've got a really, uh, what, 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 you got, that's your superpower. Yeah. I had an audition for a play called Blue Orange many years ago. It's supposed to be done in New York. And it's a three, it's a short play. Only has three characters. One's a hospital administrator. Two, a doctor slash psychiatrist. And three, a young black man who claims to be the son or illegitimate son of Idi Amin. Oh. And, yeah, the deposed dictator and that. Um, but we don't know if this kid is really clever and insane or really is who he says he is, right? But it, was, it takes place in an, the whole thing takes place in an English hospital. Blue Orange, it's called. So my agent tells me all about it. I said, okay. I got this good idea. I'm just gonna go in English. Because I noticed something about Americans. If I had started this interview with you, right, and I started talking like this the entire time from the moment you called me on my phone, rang you up on my mobile and started talking like this, then you would just say, take use English, right? But if I said I was American and then I started talking like this, those haters were sort of saying, oh, it didn't sound really English to me. Oh, oh, that word didn't sound really English. Oh, I doubt if he really just said, I don't think it's authentic. No, no, no. I find that people are full of shite, you know? <laughs> Whatever you present them with is what they will accept. All right? So, having said that, I go to this audition and I walk in. I go, uh, good morning. That's my name, is Nathaniel Freeman. I'm here for, I've got a 1045 audition. Yes. Sure, I feel this out here. All right. Yeah. So, okay. I'll be over there. Huh? They give me the sides. I'm over here. Doing my lines, doing my lines. I go in. Hello, Nathaniel. Hey, Nathaniel. Hi, nice to meet you. I'm Joanne. This is uh, Bobby. Um, do you have any questions? I said, no, yeah, it's okay. Well, there's your mark. You can adjudicate to me as if I were the camera. Don't have to look at the lens. Go whenever you're ready, all right? So, so, so I do my thing and I'll get going into it all. Yeah, so, um, well, when my dad did this, I blah, 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 granted the female gender does not like hearing that those savings is completely gone. And you're probably going to get a mountain of absolute shite for it. But trust me when I tell you, you will wish for that mountain of shit compared to what will happen to you when she discovers that on her own, right? So I'm saying this, and the woman's going, that's really nice. Can you hang on a second here. Come back, do it again, right? It's okay. Thank you. It was really lovely seeing you. Have a good day, right? I leave. I'm on my way home. I get a call from my manager, my agent. She goes, Nathaniel, I don't know what you did, but they loved you in that audition. I said, really? It's like, yeah, I think they still got to go through the formality of seeing a few more people, but I think this is yours. The only thing they were worried about is your citizenship. They were asking me, do you have a green card? And I was like, what the hell are they talking about? Why are they asking about a green card? I said, well, uh, Barbara, it's probably because I'm, when I went in, I was talking like this the entire time. I said, you did that? You didn't tell me you're American? I said, no. <laughs> They're worried about your citizenship. I said, so that's why, that's when I knew that my, my accent was authentic because one of the people in the room was actually English, you know? Unfortunately, she didn't ask me a thing about my past. She just figured, okay, we got a Brit over here, you know? One, that's not great. The park, but um, but I've, I've learned that um, you can have big muscles and big guns and all, but if you've really got a big brain and you know how to use it, infused with a little bit of humor, it can take you a lot further in life. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, you can disarm most people with, with charm, with humor, with wit, yeah, and uh, or a combination of all three. Yeah, if you can't, just have really good sneakers on so you can run. Oh, I was trying to do a run. <laughs> yes. 
The do run, run, run. The do run, run. DMC. Better on a Sunday. My heart still still. Yeah. yeah. Now, the doggy, the thing that might end this interview is my bladder. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's starting. Well, I can't believe I made it this far, to tell you the truth. But now I'm starting to feel a little bit of a tingle down there that, like, ooh, ooh. Mm. Might be time. But. Yeah, well, I, <laughs> I'm going to take them both out. Usually I walk them individually, but I'm going to take them both out because they've been so nice. Okay, and let us wrap it up. So, Space Command, um, yes. the new show. Oh, Vod Villains. I'm uh, so going to do a short film called uh, But for the Grace of God in uh, December. And... Um, well, I guess I'll keep you all informed. And uh, and, and I just read for a, a movie that if, well, if I book this, we'll start shooting next month. I'll, I'll I'll get back to you if I get this. So I don't even want to talk about it yet. But okay. yeah, got, you know, got some well, what we fun. can do, I'll tell you what we can do, kid. Like every time you have a new tab of a link, we can just add it to the description on the fly. Like even after it's... Uh, published if you know what yeah. i mean yeah. we'll just add yeah. it in and then cool. people will go down there and they'll click on it and then like magic they'll be like on the page that you want them to be on yeah does that sound good new- does that but sound yes, good to you kid thank you thank you very much <laughs> in fact i'm gonna check my instagram in about 24 hours to see if yeah this you can you, you check your instagram and i'll like uh I'll like get to the editing, but first I gotta sleep. You know, my human being, for God's sake. Well, that's I right. Gotta still, sleep. It's almost eleven. Wow. We can. My mother said I could talk the legs off an iron stove, and she was not exaggerating. Because you yeah. look like an iron stove to you. <laughs> 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 I'm not touching that one. <laughs> <laughs> Oh boy! Um, I'm Matt. Thanks, thanks so much for this. Uh, oh, we got to do. Uh, we have to do our uh, live long and prosper. Live long and prosper, my multi-talented and, friend, live Nathan. Long and prosper. Oh wow! How do you do that? I don't know how to do that. Oh, you mean this way? No, you may. It's you got to do it to raise its hand. Did you press the oh, raise hand yes. button? No, I don't. Okay. No, it doesn't. It recognizes my hand if I do that or put it down. That's pretty funny. Oh, that's the magic camera that that automatically raises its hand. When now, I do that, <laughs> they I'm need an a, update a, where it will do this. The live long and prosper symbol. Now that would be really cool. Uh, if I you could tell yeah. the difference. All right, live long and prosper. Uh, I love you so much. Uh, also, I'll, so many great accents and characters that you can just pull out of your hat. That's like amazing. It comes yeah. from me being around the people, bro. When you're around the people and you have a good ear, you can hear everything. Is, nothing is off limits to you. Bueno. Nothing is off limits, man. Nothing. Que bueno. Wait. Magnifico. So okay. thank you. All right, let me just, I, wait, I, I need to swish my hair because it's, it's perfect right now, so let me swish it one more time. Okay, there we go. All right. So luxurious. Hey, 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 like, uh, correct the mundo, correct the mundo, hey. perfect the mundo, man. Okay, one more. Have a good night. Good night. Live long and prosper one more time. Live long and prosper. Till next time. What? Wait, uh oh, it's yeah, there. We gotta get in the frame. Like, that. get on your mark for Christ's sake. All right, now. <laughs> Okay, we're going to say goodbye. We're saying goodbye. Until next time, my friend. Until next time. Got it. (laughs) Okay. Fantastic creations emerging spontaneously from the space of life. For the benefit of all beings everywhere. We gotta 